Media post on 22nd June this year, Mr. Leong Man Wai again said, and I quote, the most important economic policies that have affected the jobs and livelihoods of Singaporeans relate to foreign PMEs and free trade agreements, in particular, Zika, unquote. Mr. Speaker, these statements are false. They have been repeated for too long. I am a former trade negotiator at MTI when I was a civil servant. We worked closely on several FTAs. I worked with a very dedicated team who has over two decades fought hard for the interests of Singapore to expand our economic and political space for our small island state. And I feel I owe a duty to correct the falsehoods. Indeed, Singaporean PMEs, like PNE, PMEs in other advanced economies, are facing challenges. Many have given us their feedback, and the government has been taking steps to address their concerns. But our FTAs in general, and SICA in particular, are not the causes of the challenges our PMEs face. If anything, they are part of the solution. FTAs and SICA have been made political scapegoats to discredit the policy of the PAP government. The second reason to deliver this ministerial statement is to put in context, on behalf of MOM and MTI, the parliamentary questions that have been posed to the ministries concerning foreign PMEs, FTAs and SICA. Dr Tan Siling will further elaborate on the answers. Taken together, Dr Tan and I will address oral questions 1 to 3 and written questions 19 to 24 from yesterday's order paper and oral answers 1 to 6 and written questions 40 to 42 from today's order paper, a total of 18 questions. Several of the questions were filed by PSPs to NCMPs to gather data for a subsequent debate on the motion they intend to file. So where we can, we will provide relevant data to equip all parties for that subsequent debate. So let me recapitulate how we got here. First, I'm, as I mentioned, for months now, the PSP has alleged that FTAs and SICA have led to the unfettered flow of Indian professionals, displacing Singaporeans from their jobs and bringing about all kinds of social ills. And this is a seductively simplistic argument that workers facing challenges at their workplaces can identify with and has stirred up a lot of emotions. Seeker-themed websites have sprouted, filled with quite disturbing xenophobic views about Indian immigrants. Words gradually became deeds Toxic views turn into verbal and physical assaults on Indians, including our citizens. It is sad that serious issues concerning the economic well-being of our country and workers have descended to this. That is why the Minister for Law called out such xenophobic behaviour during the May sitting of this House and challenged the PSP to table a motion on SICA so that the matter could receive a proper public airing. The PSP has since made a public statement on the matter, standing by its view on FTA and SICA. It filed several parliamentary questions requesting for more data and information. So today I will talk about the following. One, what is fundamental to Singapore's ability to earn a living and survive? Two, why FTAs, including SICA, advance our interests and are not the cause of the challenges faced by our workers? And three, what then are the causes of Singaporeans' concerns and how do we address them? Dr Tan will provide detailed answers to the specific questions, including providing the data which will be useful for our subsequent debate and putting that data in context. 
Let me start with the first question. What is fundamental to our economic survival? Simply put, we are too small to survive on our own, and we need to tap into the global markets to earn a living and be self-reliant. What do we have to start with? We have no natural resources, but we have one precious natural endowment, and that is our geographical location. It is a lasting advantage, but one which requires us to work very hard to realize and to sustain. And if we succeed, it helps compensate for our lack of size. And that is what we have done. By capturing the trade flow through the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, PSA became the largest container transshipment port in the world. It is a unique interchange in the world, connecting East and West, Europe, Middle East, India, China, and the port is central to the growth of the maritime industry, responsible for 160,000 jobs in Singapore today. In addition to our seaport, we also have grown into an aviation node. Before COVID-19 hit us, Changi was one of the busiest airports in the world, and it shall be so again. Though in aviation terms, our geographical location is not quite ideal, we made it happen with, with the renowned Changi and SIA experience. Before COVID-19 struck, the aviation-related industry were supporting 190,000 jobs. So with these good global connections, we built up the manufacturing sector, about one-fifth of our GDP today. And we obviously don't manufacture just for Singapore, we're too small, but we manufacture for the world. And manufacturing supports another 440,000 jobs today. Our exports also include trade in services, and one growing services sector is financial services. And today, almost every major global financial services institution is in Singapore, carrying out a range of activities, including new ones, such as fintech and green finance. The financial services sector employs over 170,000 people. We are also becoming a centre for technology, research and development. So many global firms, from FANG to BET, and many more are in Singapore. And they make Singapore their regional or global innovation center or engineering hubs. And today, 50,000 international companies operate out of Singapore. 750 of them have made Singapore their regional headquarters. None of this would have happened without a clear strategy implemented well. It was a long, painstaking process, part of the story of our island nation. Clean government, rule of law, safety, you can walk on the street any time of the day, political stability, good infrastructure, high standards of education, openness to the world, all this and more come together to make us a good place to invest and create many jobs. I should emphasize that another big plus point for us is the quality of the Singaporean workforce. Our people are well known to be well educated, diligent, responsible, trustworthy, and we get things done. We have one problem, which is there are too few of us Singaporeans, a point which I will come back to later. On top of all these plus points, we have built a network of 26 free trade agreements, including the US, China, EU, ASEAN, Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand, all our major markets, and they are all our FTA partners. And this brings me to the next topic, why FTAs, including SICA, are important to Singapore. We started our FTA strategy in the late 1990s. We thought through it carefully and executed before other countries did. So it gave us a very precious early mover advantage and greatly boosted our efforts to export, attract 
investments, venture overseas, and created good jobs for Singaporeans. Our total trade is three times our GDP. Since 2005, our total trade has nearly doubled from around 890 billion Sing dollars to now 1.5 trillion Sing dollars. And today when EDB goes out and persuades investors to come to Singapore, our network of FTAs is always a major selling point. FTAs are especially important to our SMEs. If free, they free them from being constrained by our small domestic market and give them access to global markets. So our SMEs are sending all kinds of Singapore-made products overseas, from canned food, barbecued pork, frozen roti prata, I heard some are exported to India, to medical devices, machines, components, chemicals. FTAs are also spurring our companies to venture abroad. abroad. Our investments overseas increased nearly five times, from 200 billion Sing dollars 2005 to over 930 billion Sing dollars 2019. So when our companies grow overseas, they become stronger, and they also employ more Singaporeans here. If we accept this basic reality that Singapore needs the world to earn a living, then we would realize the fundamental importance of all our FTAs. They are a keystone of the economic superstructure that we have built. We could not have advanced the welfare of Singaporeans to the degree that we have without FTAs. We cannot take all this for granted. Recently, we fell in the 2021 IMD World Competitiveness Ranking from first place to the fifth place. Amongst the components evaluated, we continue to do very well in terms of government efficiency and economic competitiveness. However, we lost ground in terms of openness towards global talent and trade. But I hope this is temporary and due to the effects of COVID-19. Overall, we are still holding our own in terms of foreign investments. In 2020, even as 45 companies ceased operating their regional or global headquarters in Singapore, over 130 companies set up such headquarters here. So when you attack FTAs, and worst, if your attacks succeed, you are undermining the fundamentals of our existence, of the way we earn a living, of all the sectors FTAs support, and the hundreds and thousands of Singaporean jobs created in these sectors. As the attacks on FTA, especially Seeker, have been very specific, let me now spend some time to explain how FTA works. And to prepare for this statement, I have to dig up my old negotiating notes and do quite a bit of revision and homework. Here it goes. The key disciplines of an FTA are as follows. It requires a country to remove or lower tariffs on substantially all trade between the FTA partners. This is of tremendous benefit to Singapore. Very good deal. Why? Because other countries customarily impose tariffs on thousands of items. We are already very open. We impose duties on only three alcoholic products. Beer, stout, and samsu. All my years of negotiating FTA, I don't know what samsu is, neither have I drank it before. But these are our three tariff items. Hence, any FDA that substantially removes tariffs imposed by both parties is inherently beneficial to Singapore. FDAs also require governments to accord protection to foreign investments and ensure that regulations are imposed fairly and equally on both local and foreign firms. They also set standards on protection of intellectual property. Singapore, we always protect foreign investments and applies our regulations fairly. This makes us 
attractive to foreign investors. So it's, it, was, it has always been our interest to do that. So abiding to these principles and disciplines uh, is not a problem for us at all. In fact, as more of companies expand overseas and they create their own products, they too hope that Singapore can negotiate similar protection for them when they go overseas. So the investment and intellectual property protection disciplines in FTAs are therefore important assurances for our companies. Newer FTAs also set certain environmental and labour standards. Not every country supports them, but Singapore believes that they reflect contemporary concerns relating to free trade and investments. And specifically on SICA, this FTA with India benefits Singapore in many ways. Signed in 2005, it was India's first comprehensive bilateral FTA with any country. And SICA gave Singapore a strategic first mover advantage in India just when a continental country was taking off to be an economic powerhouse. SICA reduces tariff barriers, which made Singapore goods more competitive in the Indian market. And partly because of that, bilateral trade between Singapore and India has grown by over 80%. From 20 billion Sing dollars when SICA came into force in 2005 to 38 billion Sing dollars in 2019. And similarly, Singapore's direct investment abroad in India grew by 50 times, 5 0, from 1.3 billion Sing dollars to 61 billion Sing dollars during the same period. In 2019, 660 companies from Singapore have investments in India, almost double the number a decade ago. As these companies grow originally, they hire more people back home, and in 2019, they employed 97,000 locals. Despite these significant benefits, FDAs are controversial in many countries. As a trade negotiator, I've listened to the problems and sensitivities of many of our FDA partners. What are these sensitivities? Some countries wish to protect certain sectors, such as agriculture. That's a very common one, which Singapore does not do. We have some eggs, we have some fish, but more for a bit of source diversification. We never seek to conquer the world with our eggs and our sea buses. Others could not live up to say the transparency standards of say government procurement or intellectual property disciplines. Still others are concerned about the influences of foreign culture through industries such as arts and entertainment. Canada, for example, very sensitive about this area. So the toughest job and the most time-consuming job of a negotiator is to identify and understand the sensitivity sector, sensitivities of your country, and then find ways to protect or to address them. How do we do so? We find words that give you comfort, that address the sensitivity. And we call these words, in our jargon, exceptions or carve-outs. When we have a big carve-out, with strong protection in our sensitivity, sensitive areas, we will say this carve out is strong and big enough for a jumbo jet to fly through. In some sensitive areas, it is easy to negotiate exceptions or carve outs because everyone agrees. One example is right of taxation by governments. Another one is national security. A third one, is immigration. Every country holds the view that there cannot be unfettered movement of people across borders. Every FTA partner believes that. That would create social unrest and a big public uproar. Governments must retain the ability to impose immigration and border controls, and FTAs cannot undermine that. Hence, in all FTAs and also WTO agreements, you will find that immigration powers are strongly and prominently preserved and protected. You can find such standard clauses in the WTO agreement as well 
as in all our FTAs, including Sika. As so many falsehoods have been said about the immigration-related parts of Sika, let me set out in some detail what is really in the agreement. Immigration matters are set out in Chapter 9 of Sika, Movement of Natural Persons. The legal text is available online, so I will only detail the salient points. One, the chapter makes it clear that government's ability to regulate immigration and foreign manpower is not affected by the agreement. The government retains full rights to decide who can enter the country to live, to work, become PRs or become citizens. This is clearly set out in two clauses. They are standard clauses commonly found in all FTAs. And they are also the second and third paragraphs of the chapter of Sika. So it is hard to miss them, as you can see them on the first page. I will just read them out. Clause 9.1.2. This chapter shall not apply to measures pertaining to citizenship, permanent residence, or employment on a permanent basis. Clause 9.1.3. Nothing contained in this chapter shall prevent a party from applying measures to regulate the entry or temporary stay of natural persons of the other party in its territory, including measures necessary to protect the integrity of its territory and to ensure the orderly movement of natural persons across its borders. That's the first point. Second point, the obligations relating to the movement of natural persons in Sika as in all FTAs, are not broad principles with wide applications, but actually highly specific. What are these broad principles that you can find in FTA? One broad principle is that of national treatment. It is found in some chapters of FTA, such as trade in services and investments. This means, I mentioned this just now, this means you cannot discriminate against foreign service providers and investors. Whether they are local investors or foreign investors, you treat them the same. Regulations and benefits that apply to local firms must apply evenly to foreign-owned ones. So, if immigration had not been carved out and national treatment principle had been incorporated into Chapter 9 of SICA, then indeed... Indian workers would have been treated, would have to be treated like Singaporeans and would have had free reign to come to live and work in Singapore. That is what the PSP claims, except that there is a strong immigration carve out and national treatment is not found in Chapter 9 of SICA, nor any other corresponding chapter in the FTAs that Singapore has entered into. Mr. Speaker, sir, I emphasize and underline and highlight and bow with bigger fonts, color red, that nothing in this agreement implies Singapore must unconditionally let in PMEs from India. Contrary to PSP's claim, our ability to impose requirements for immigration and work pass has never been in question in SICA or any other FTA. FTAs that we have signed. Instead, then what are the obligations of Chapter 9 of SICA? They are highly specific, such as require the parties to process applications for temporary entry with some expedition and with certain transparency, such as informing the applicants of the outcome of their applications and not leave them in suspense. A very reasonable thing to do and to agree to adhere to. We also have to accord a certain duration for the validity of the permits should we approve. And approval must be based on them meeting our prevailing work pass conditions. Also very reasonable. Such a commitment on duration is also not something unique to SICA because similar commitments exist in other FTAs and are also found in WTO agreement signed by 164 members, including Singapore. 
Many parties to FTAs also commit not to impose labour market tests. This is a common clause in our FTAs, including with India, Australia, China and the US. It means we do not insist that companies go through onerous processes and documentation to prove that no suitable locals will take a job before they can hire a foreigner. Companies in Singapore or any other places do not hire this way. What they do, the common and best practice, is to interview suitable candidates, consider them all fairly, and then make a judgment on the best person. And these are all market-friendly, widely adopted, reasonable obligations. Let me also specifically address two aspects of the chapter on movement of natural person in Sika that has been singled out for criticism. First, the PSP pointed out that Sika listed 127 categories of professionals and hence claimed that Indian nationals in these professions can all freely come here to work for a year. This is false because, as I explained earlier, all foreign PMEs have to meet our work pass conditions in order to come and work here. The listing then, what does it, what does the listing then show? The listing shows the types of Indian professionals who may apply to work in Singapore. It does not mean that we must approve their application. It's just that you can apply. India, for its own reasons, requested for such a list, similar to what they have in their FTAs with Korea and Japan. In fact, even if they had not listed the professions, their PMEs could still submit work pass applications to work here. But it, the list probably meant something to India because there may be countries that will not even let you apply. Yeah, that's how protectionist some countries may become. And India is trying to secure their interests there. This is in fact how other FTA works. With or without listing of professions, nationals from our FTA partners are not precluded from submitting work pass applications, which will be evaluated based on our prevailing criteria and work pass conditions. Thus, the point being made by PSP on the list of the 127 profession is a red herring. The list does not confer any free pass to any Indian nationals. The second common criticism is that intra-corporate transferees from India can also freely enter Singapore to work. Based on my explanation on how the chapter works, this is again not true. Intra-corporate transferees also have to meet our work pass qualifying criteria. In any case, the total number of intra-corporate transferees from all over the world and not just India that have come to Singapore to work is very small. In 2020, there were only about 500 intra-corporate transferees from India to Singapore, in Singapore, less than 0.3% of all employment pass holders or EP holders. <clears throat> so, Mr. Speaker, sir, I hope we can put a stop to all this misinformation about our FTAs in general and SICA in particular. Nevertheless, it is important that we need to recognise that PMEs in Singapore do face challenges. And I see at least three challenges that they are facing. First, there is more competition from foreign PMEs. Indeed, the number of EP holders has increased from 65,000 in 2005 to 177,000 in 2020. So an increase over 15 years of 112,000 or an annual growth rate of just under 7%. Over this period, however, the increase in number of local PMEs in, is much higher by over 380,000. So 380,000 for local PMEs, 112,000 for EP holders. And these numbers underline an important point, that competition 
between foreign and local PMEs is not a zero-sum game. In fact, the converse is often true. By combining and complementing local and foreign expertise, we can attract more investments and create many more good jobs and career choices for Singaporeans. The downside is that with more foreign PMEs in Singapore, they can compete for jobs with locals at the company level. And at that level, there can be a zero-sum situation. So there is a trade-off at play here, if I put it simply. <clears throat> a, many jobs, strong competition. B, few jobs, no competition. And we need to find the right balance where there are more jobs, some competition. And that is the way to advance the interests of Singaporeans, not swing to any extreme position, but strike that careful balance and then adjust if we find that that balance is off. But if someone promises you more jobs, no competition from foreigners, is selling you snake oil. It is not possible. It cannot be on any government's policy menu. I should point out that besides complementing our local workforce to create more opportunities, foreign PMEs also help cushion the impact on the local workforce when times are bad. Because during a downturn, foreigners bear the brunt of job losses. During COVID-19 for the 12 months to April 2021, the number of employment pass holders dropped by about 21,600. And S-Pass holders fell by about 26,800. Altogether, 50 over 1,000 for over the 12 months. On the other hand, local employment has been stable. Unemployment rate for local PMEs in June 2020, this is a labour market survey, so it comes out only once a year during June. So June 2020, unemployment rate for local PMEs despite this is immediately after the circuit breaker, was at 2.9%. Resident unemployment rate, September 2020 was 4.8%. May 2021, 3.8%. Came down by one percentage point. Without the foreign buffer, when our economy ran into trouble, the situation would have been much worse. Singaporeans would have lost many more jobs. So while the stock of EP and S-Pass holders can fluctuate, Singaporeans enjoy greater security of employment. With help from various government measures, job support scheme, help firm, help enterprises keep their workers. We have a multi-ministry national jobs council came up with many initiatives to help place displaced Singaporeans into jobs including also a job growth incentive to help to encourage companies to hire local workers. So when Mr. Leong Man Wai said in his Facebook post that we need to recoup a few tens of thousands of jobs from foreign work pass holders, he may not know that we have already done so. This always happens in a downturn. The second challenge is the profile of foreign PMEs. They are concentrated in certain sectors and from certain countries of origin. And indeed, as our digital economy and our needs for tech talent grew, more PMEs from India came into Singapore through our EP framework. And when that concentration happens in areas such as Changi Business Park, some may feel that we have lost a part of Singapore. Members of the House have raised this concern. We are taking this seriously and studying what we can do to lessen the problem. I hasten to add that dealing with excessive concentration is not a straightforward matter of chopping up the operations of a company here. We don't want to unintentionally cause the whole investment to move elsewhere. And this will hurt even more Singaporeans. And this is part of the careful balancing that I talked about earlier. Third. At the company level, there may be unfair hiring practices, with department heads 
preferring to hire foreign PMEs or even foreign PMEs from certain countries. And this is not right. Whatever system we set up, there will always be some abuses. We must tackle the abuses when they occur as swiftly as possible, while continuing to adopt sensible economic policies that are good for Singapore and Singaporeans. MOM takes a strong stance against such discriminatory practices and together with our tripartite partners has been actively enforcing against errant employers. The Minister for Manpower will speak on this further. <clears throat> I have explained the underlying reasons for the difficulties faced by our PMEs so that we know what it means for us in terms of public policy choices and how we can most effectively address the challenges. If we mistakenly blame FTAs and SICA for these problems, our responses would be disastrously wrong and would make our problems worse. Mr. Speaker, let me say something in Mandarin. <clears throat> Chen 政府认真看待民众的担忧我们对待问题的时候夺去新加坡人的工作也挑起了一部分国人的排外情绪第一点新加坡的经济支柱是什么国人才能安居乐业可以让我们的小企业打入国际市场大展拳脚 
、亚细安、中国、美国、欧盟、日本、韩国、印度、澳大利亚、新西兰等等，都是我们的主要市场，也是我们的自贸伙伴。自贸协定呢，也帮助我们招商引资。经济发展局经常说，当他们说服跨国公司在新加坡投资的时候。推销的一个很强的一点就是我们的自贸协定网络，我们的二十六个协定。当投资商来到新加坡，我们的自贸协定能帮他们进军世界各大主要市场。此外，在自贸协定的规定下，新加坡政府也有义务给他们投资，给他们的投资一定的保护。第三点，那为什么前进党的说法不正确呢？因为他们歪曲了这个自贸协定的用意，歪曲了歪曲了新加坡谈判团队的用心，冤枉了我们。他们说西加让印度一百二十七个专业类别的人士可以自由入境，在新加坡生活和工作，这种说法其实是荒谬的。一百二十七个专业类别是协议里列出来的一个清单。列出来的一个清单，好让相关人士参考。意思是说，你可以申请到新加坡工作，并不是说你一定会被批准。这两回事啊！最终，申请者还是必须先符合申请工作准准证的先决条件，才可能获得就业准证来新加坡工作。在我们所有的自贸协定里，我们的移民和外籍人才政策保持不变。谁能够入境新加坡，谁能得到工作准证，谁能成为永久居民，谁能成为公民，都由我们全权决定。第四，那我们新加坡专业人士的压力来自哪里？简单说，来自全球化的竞争。全球化的经济，我们一方面必须打开放市场，为国人打造机遇；另一方面，处理它所带来的所有的竞争。所谓我们打开了窗，阳光、苍蝇都进来了。但外来竞争并不完全是零和游戏。若我们减少引进一些，外国专才不等于国人必然就会有更多的工作机会。相反的，本地和外来的专才能够相辅相成，一起吸引更多外来的投资，制造更多好的就业机会。所以，作为一个依赖全球经济的小国，我们面临以下的简单选择 ：A。很多竞争，很多工作，还是 B， 很少竞争，很少工作，两个极端我们都不要。我们要找的是一个平衡点，不能够矫枉过正，要确保国人继续有足够的好的工作，一些竞争是难免的。如果有人跟你敲锣打鼓，他说给你一个没竞争。多工作的经济模式，这个人肯定是吹牛、高要乱卖。我们面临的另一个挑战是，我国正在全力发展数码和信息科技。这个世界里，数码专才，中国、印度最多。中国专才都倾向于留在当地工作，因为他们的独角兽多嘛。印度专才车。往外跑，到外地寻寻求发展，因此，对新加坡相对来说，印度籍的数码科技专业人士变成比较多了。这是我们必须正视的现象。政府部门正在同业界人士探讨是否能够采取离岸外包的做法，让我们只留下较高端的工作，以减少外来人的数目。不过，我们要谨慎的处理，确保不会流失整个重要的外地投资。我们应该继续探讨如何解决问题
，保障新加坡人的就业机会，使新加坡人在公平竞争的环境下脱颖而出。而，但是请不要随意听取不确实的言论，排斥自由贸易协会、是自由贸易协定和西嘎，以免动摇新加坡开放经济的根基。我们注意到，世界上很多国家都面对了排外主义的问题。我们不能够让他们在新加坡生根。我们应该应该设法消除人民的忧虑，解决人民的问题。政府有决心这么做，但我们需要新加坡人的配合，同心协力，一起守护国家繁荣的基础。Mr. Speaker, sir, I'll switch back to English to finish my speech. As I explained earlier, <clears throat> our FTA strategy has benefited Singaporeans and Singapore. So it is disappointing that FTAs are now a target of political attacks. But perhaps I should not be surprised, as this has happened in many countries. Such a debate goes beyond FTAs. The question of global versus local has emerged as the new dominant political divide in democracies around the world. In the US, labor unions and various industry lobbies are against free trade. The Trump administration pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership within a week of taking office, even though US was the architect of the TPP agreement. In the UK, Brexit was the culmination of a bitter political contest between those who want to be part of the European Union and those who wanted out. In France, the next presidential election is likely to be a face-off between the incumbent, President Macron, and the far-right nationalist candidate. These political divides arose because of globalization. While globalization presents opportunities and creates jobs, it also brings about greater competition, displacement of industries and jobs, inflow of immigration, of immigrants, beg your pardon. These consequences go beyond the economic sphere and often strike at the heart of a nation and a community's sense of identity and security. And this is the most unsettling change causing people to become unsure if they are on the whole better with globalization. And such concerns are genuine and deserve serious and proper attention. We are a small country, and an unrestricted flow of workers from a large country can change the lived experience of Singaporeans, alter the character of our society, and even overwhelm us. But we need to be careful that these valid concerns are not exploited by political groups and intentionally or not end up sowing division, stoking fear, fanning hatred. As representatives of the people, we all have a responsibility to realize that our words and deeds can shape public opinion and the direction of our political discourse. That is why when Mr. Leong Man Wai said in this house some months ago, that the naturalized Singaporean CEO of DBS was not homegrown and deemed this a failure, Minister Iswaran responded with a word of caution. And I agree with Minister Iswaran and feel that members of the House should be very careful about what we say on such matters if we are not to give credence to a very negative, even ugly, minority view. And that is also why we appreciate that the leader of the opposition standing up to say that when it comes to racism and xenophobia, we all have to reject them and there can be no ifs and buts about it. Mr. Speaker, sir, before I conclude, let me remind members that the House has invoked Standing Order 44 so that the members from the PSP can give a full response after Dr. Tan Siling's speech. But even if Mr. Yong Man Wai and Ms. Hazel Pua choose not to, I will be happy to clarify questions from members. The PAP always fight for the welfare of Singaporeans. 
We have done so for more than 60 years now. Kept our country safe, brought jobs to Singaporeans, built up our infrastructure, and taken care of the welfare of all. As a city-state connected to the world, we want to welcome diverse talents from all over the world. And when they are here, we invite them to fit into our society, respect our social habits and norms, appreciate our multicultural society, join us at our hawker centres, try some durians, try some samba balachan, speak a few phrases of Singlish. And when Singaporeans, we go overseas to live and work, and about 200,000 of us do, we expect the same of ourselves and hope that we also receive hospitable welcomes from our foreign hosts too. I decided to make this statement today so that we can approach the debate on the PSP's subsequent motion with the right perspective and motivation. The House should continue to debate robustly the pros and cons of various policies to help Singapore navigate this balance between global and local. But we must not inadvertently shake the bedrock that has enabled Singapore to succeed. We cannot survive, we cannot earn a living without being connected to the world, without being welcoming to the world, without the House unanimously supporting our FTA strategy. And we must always be a big-hearted people, even while we grapple with the significant challenges of globalisation to forge the best path forward for Singapore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister for Manpower will be making a related ministerial statement. Members will be able to seek clarifications on both statements during the debate after this statement. Minister for Manpower. Mr Speaker, in his statement, Minister Ong has explained why FTAs are critical to Singapore, as well as how they have reaped, they've helped us reap significant benefits for our fellow Singaporeans. The same goes for our openness to foreign workers. We take the same approach when we decide on foreign workers coming to work in Singapore. How does it help Singaporeans? At the start of the 1970s, our GDP was $20 billion. Now, the economy has grown to $454 billion. Foreign workers account for around one-third of our workforce. There are more than 2.3 million locals who are employed, and our resident unemployment rate is 4.1%, half of what it was in 1970. We need to understand the real challenges we are facing today in order to have a constructive debate on the way forward. And that is why we're having these two ministerial statements. I will explain with data, with details, as to exactly how our foreign workforce policies are implemented in order to benefit, in order to benefit our fellow Singaporeans. And I will also give our perspective on the real challenges that we face today and the real solutions that is demanded. Associate Professor James Lim and Mr Leong asked for the number of intra-corporate transferees, or ICTs for short, professionals and dependents that come in through SICA. Now let me reiterate a point that Minister Ong has made, and that is none of our FTAs, including SICA, gives intra-corporate transferees, or ICTs, unfettered access to our labour market. So please remember that. They all have to meet Ministry of Manpower's prevailing work pass criteria. Under the ICT route, the employer does not have to advertise on mycareersfuture.sg, but the ICTs themselves are subject to additional checks on their seniority, on their employment history, as well as their work and industry experience. They are also subject to more conditions in their eligibility to bring in dependents, whether they want to apply for permanent residency or future employment in Singapore. And if they have brought in dependents, the dependents do not have 
the automatic right to work here. They can only do so if they qualify for a work pass on their own merits. This is a very fundamental point, and I hope that everyone will remember this. So thus, and as mentioned by Minister Ong, the total number of ICTs has consistently been very small. In 2020, last year, there were only about 4,200 ICTs. Of these, about 500 were from India. That is 500 out of 177,000 EP holders in Singapore. As for the number of professional visas issued, I'm afraid to disappoint Mr. Leong. There is no such category within MOM. As Minister Ong explained, all 127 categories of professionals under seeker currently come in under our regular work pass framework. Now, the PSP has made Indian nationals coming in through seeker a focus of contention, but I'm afraid they have been barking up the wrong tree. The number of ICTs coming in under our FTAs, and in particular seeker, is a very, very small number relative to the total, numbers, uh, total number of EPs. So I suggest we set aside this red herring and move on, more importantly, to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is this. How do we, as a small country, devoid of any natural resources, remain open to global talent for us to continue to create opportunities for our fellow country Singaporeans while at the same time managing the attendant social repercussions. Singaporeans are pragmatic. They understand we need to remain open to global tal talent. However, they also face real challenges. In particular, they are worried about three things. First, that the growth in EP holders has come at the expense of our local PMEs. Second, that some workplaces have become more concentrated with a single nationality. Third, that there may be discrimination against local job seekers and employees. I've come from the private sector and I understand and I empathise with these fears these concerns and these anxieties. I would like to address each of them in turn because I want to lay out the facts and also share our approach in dealing with each one of them. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of our approaches are perfect. And obviously, we are always a works in progress. But we will continue to refine them in the light of our experiences, always with a focused view to having a system that will and that can deliver good jobs, good livelihoods, and a thriving economy for Singaporeans, not just for our generation, but for our future generations. And I hope this will enable us to arrive at a better understanding of the choices and the trade-offs that we constantly have to make. First, on the increased competition from foreign PMEs. In Singapore, today, we have one of the best local talent pools in the world. But it is insufficient to meet the breadth, the depth, the needs of the investments that generate the quality and the range of jobs that we have today. So when we bring in new investments, we will sometimes need to attract foreign expertise foreign talent while we build up our local capabilities. Ms. Hazel Pua, Associate Professor James Lim and Mr. Saktiandi Supat asked for the breakdown of local and of foreign workforce numbers by sector. Given the issue at hand, let me focus on EPs. As of 2020, we have around 177,000 EPs or employment pass holders in our overall workforce. Manufacturing and construction account for about one-tenth. The rest are in the services sector. And if you look at the top three subsectors downwards, Infocom and professional services 
collectively, these two sectors account for around one-fifth each, while finance accounts for another one-seventh. If you look at the change from 2005, I think that was around the time where SICA was signed, to 2020, the total number of EPs has increased by around 112,000. This was also mentioned in Min Ong's uh, speech earlier on. Over this same period, the number of total PMEs, local, the number of local PMEs increased significantly by more than 380,000. Now, there have been questions asked, both inside and outside of this house, whether most of the growth in local PME jobs was accounted for by Singapore citizens. If you look at our unemployment statistics, we provide the figure for Singapore citizens. The citizen unemployment rate over the past 10 years has been consistently low, at around 3%. Hence, the answer must be a yes. Now, for those of you who have asked how much of this local PME job growth has gone to born and bred Singaporeans, notwithstanding the divisive intent of this kind of questioning, let me state simply that the majority of this growth over the past decade went to Singaporeans born in Singapore. And as we have also shared in response to a written parliamentary question yesterday, 87% of Singapore citizens were born here. So much attention has been placed on the finance and the infocom sectors, which alone accounted for 40% of the increase in EP holders. Now, this is significant. But what is even more significant is that these two sectors saw even stronger job creation for local PMEs. In Infocom, the number of EPs increased by around 25,000. The number of jobs created in this sector alone for local PMEs was greater at 35,000. In finance, the number of EPs increased by around 20,000. But the number of jobs created for local PMEs was even greater, at around 85,000. This is more than four times. Now, we focus on these two sectors because they bring good quality jobs. And Singapore, our beloved Singapore, can carve out an advantage and value add significantly in these areas. And as a result, there has been significant job creation. Now, as we attract foreign banks, Infocom companies to create jobs here, they will inevitably need foreign workers to complement the Singaporean workforce. I want to deal with a fundamental misconception, which lies at the heart of some of the things being misconstrued. When a company decides to come into Singapore to invest, and they need about 3,000 people, they may be able to find about 2,500 of these talents in Singapore but they still need to supplement that 2005 with the other additional 500 from overseas. Now, if we object and we insisted that the balance of that 500 must all come from Singapore, irrespective, then how do we expect that investment to take off? How do you expect that investment to come in? These 2,500 jobs for the locals would be compromised greatly. So the simple point is that while we have a good Singaporean talent pool, our pool is not large enough to fulfill all of the needs, the breadth and the depth of these enterprises. And very often, foreigners also bring in skills which complement Singaporeans' skill sets as well. So the misconception is that if we said no to the foreigners coming in, and the misconception people think is that these jobs they would have taken would therefore all go to Singaporeans. How can this be possible? I mean, this is a misconception. How do I know that this is a misconception? Because today, even as we speak, we still have 22,000 PME jobs that are not filled. Companies are desperate to fill these jobs. They would love to take in Singaporeans if they could, because Singaporeans are more productive. But these jobs up to now are still not filled. Perhaps Mr. Leong would like to think 
deeply about that and deliberate and offer us some advice. Now, Mr. Leung also suggests that doing away with foreigners will reduce the displacement of our, local, of our older PMEs. I wish that were so. But private sector and the real economy do not operate this way. There will always be displacement of PMEs, whether older or younger, in any economy. Why? Because the business world is never static. Industries change, companies downsize, they expand, they relocate, they pivot, they transform. Now, even if, regardless of whether you're foreigners or not, that would not change because this is the function of the business world. What matters most for us is whether we are able to find jobs for these displaced PMEs. And to do this, we need an ecosystem where there is also new companies willing to come and start up in Singapore, new investments, new foreign direct investments coming in, and expanding multinational corporations. So far, I think we've done credibly in this regard. New jobs created have far exceeded the jobs that have been lost. And our employment rate has been kept low. And the re-entry rates for displaced PMEs are high. That said, it is not always easy or possible to find every single displaced PME an equivalent job in the same industry, especially if there's a skills mismatch. An IT sales manager who loses his job may not find a job as a cybersecurity expert, but we do our best to help them find jobs in other growth sectors. If we tell companies which want to invest in Singapore that they can only employ Singaporeans, or first, employ Singaporeans who have been displaced regardless of skills, I think the answer will be quite stark. They, I think, would opt not to come into Singapore to invest. All companies will want to hire Singaporeans, but companies will also need to have that flexibility to hire the best available talent from around the world to complement our Singaporean workforce. Now, I understand. I understand what displaced Singaporeans are going through. Rest assured, we are doing our best to help you and your families. But it is important that we go into the root cause of the problem, we are able to tackle it, and we are able to diagnose the situation accurately and not provide treatment to just treat and relieve the symptoms. Because only when we can identify the right solution, we are able to prescribe, we are able to provide the precise and the appropriate treatment. The fundamental question now is how do we strike a balance between ensuring that businesses have access to skill sets, to manpower, to grow and succeed, whilst creating opportunities for our local workers to grow and to progress. Our strategy to, receive, to achieve this has always been two-pronged, ensuring that our workers can compete fairly and can compete strongly. So the first is to ensure that our local workers can compete fairly. We do this through our work pass controls. Our view, our prevalent view, is that foreign manpower should not come to Singapore just because they are cheaper to hire than locals. They should complement but not displace our local workforce. They should bring in extra skills to help the companies and at the same time create more Singaporean jobs. In line with these objectives, at the work permit and the S-Pass level, we have quotas and we have levies in place to regulate foreign worker numbers. We have been progressively tightening quotas. We have been progressively raising levies to reduce manpower reliance, spur job redesign, push for quality growth. In the past, over the past decade, we have consistently and steadfastly helped our cause 
in spite of numerous calls from businesses to relax our rules. We commit to productivity-led growth because we believe many of these jobs have the potential to be transformed into good jobs that provide higher real wages and rewarding careers for Singaporeans. For EPs, we do not impose quotas or levies because there is fierce competition for global talent and worldwide shortages in areas such as tech and digital skills. A quota would be a hard cap that would limit our ability to compete at the high end of the global economy, while for a levy to have any impact or any effect at all on EP numbers, it would have to be set very high and would substantially increase business costs. Instead, what we have done is that we have focused on setting and raising the quality bar for EP holders through requirements on salary and qualifications to make sure that the EPs who come in are at the right level and they bring the right skill sets the necessary expertise and experience to contribute significantly to our economy. Last year, we raised the EP minimum qualifying criteria. Uh, sorry, uh, last year we raised the EP minimum qualifying salary in two steps, from three thousand six hundred to three thousand nine hundred dollars, and then we raised it again to four thousand five hundred dollars. The salary requirement increases with age. It's also on a graduated scale, which reflects the candidate's experience, his length of time in the workforce in order to provide sufficient protection for our mature workers. We also introduced a higher bar of $5,000 for applicants in the finance sector to take into account the higher wage norms in that sector. We will continue to review, we will continue to revise these thresholds regularly to ensure that they remain appropriate and they remain in tandem as our economy develops, as our skills, as our e income levels go up. Mr. Leung has also previously raised in this House his concern that foreign EPs are cheaper to hire than locals, simply because their employers do not make CPF contributions. I think he fit, fundamentally misunderstands the purpose of our CPF. CPF is set aside for our retirement needs. It can also be used for housing. As foreign PMEs who are not working in Singapore on a permanent basis, I don't think we should be responsible for their retirement adequacy or home ownership needs. Hence, I don't think it makes sense for us to extend our CPF benefits and coverage to them. Fundamentally, our CPF system is designed to benefit our resident workers, not to help attract or deter foreigners. Instead, when reviewing qualifying salary to maintain a level playing field, we take into account CPF contributions as part of the cost to employers. So that is packaging into the cost to employers. Now, Mr. Leong did not suggest that employers should pay foreign CPF too. I think he realises this. Instead, he says he wants to impose a $1,200 levy on EP holders. But as I've just explained, a levy is not the most effective or the right way to manage the population of foreign PMEs. I think that it would be better served, better managed by appropriately setting the right salary level for entry into Singapore. Ms. Hazel Pua has also asked for numbers on dependents in Singapore. Now, this is relevant insofar as they are competing with locals for jobs. As shared previously, the vast majority of dependents, uh, dependent pass holders do not work during their stay in Singapore. The number of dependent pass holders who have sought employment in Singapore via a letter of consent. So they need, for dependent pass holders, up to May, if they want to work, they need to get a letter of consent, LOC. This number constitutes only about 1% of all work pass holders. In fact, if members would remember, we have already regularised the work arrangements of DP holders in May this year. And in May this year, DP holders who wish to work in Singapore can no longer obtain the letter of consent. 
Instead, they will have to qualify for a relevant work pass on their own merit. So they go through the normal routes. Now, there will always be calls from workers to tighten our foreign workforce policies further. Just as there will always be calls from businesses to relax them. And I can tell you that in my past life, I was also guilty of that. I've also lobbied to relax you know, work passes. I mean, that was a function of a listed company. So it is a constant tightrope that the Ministry of Manpower and the Ministry of Trade and Industry have to constantly navigate very delicately amidst highly competitive global markets for both investments and talent. There are limits, ladies and gentlemen, there are limits as to how far we can tighten our controls without eventually hurting Singaporeans. With remote working becoming more prevalent, companies increasingly do not need to cite their manpower in Singapore. In fact, we may find more businesses simply choosing to move entire business functions offshore if it becomes too difficult, onerous, or expensive to operate here. Singaporeans will end up with a shorter end of the stick as well by losing some jobs too. And this is precisely why the second prong of our approach, that of ensuring that our Singaporeans can compete strongly, is just as important. In an open and globalised labour market like ours, competition is intense and stiff. There will be some of our fellow Singaporeans who are displaced from their jobs, and we need to help them find replacement jobs. This happens not just because of competition from foreign workers, but because of other factors like technological change and industries phasing out. And this is why the government invests so heavily in retraining, in skills development, so that displaced workers can gain new skills and reinvent themselves either by doing a different job in the same industry or transiting to another industry altogether. In fact, some industries, as they get sunsetted, we have to help workers to pivot and transform even faster. And really, that is the subject of the 23 industry transformation maps that have been set up over the last couple of years. As Mr Lim Sui Se used to say, in Singapore, we are unable to guarantee your employment, but rest assured, we will work very, very, very hard to ensure your employability. Upgrading skills and staying relevant is ultimately our workers' best form of protection. We do this through our system of education, through training, and that goes beyond formal schooling. We do this via Skills Future. We also help displaced Singaporeans through job facilitation and support. COVID-19 has been an especially difficult time for many Singaporeans, and therefore we have stepped up support. As announced at Budget this year, we have extended the SG United Jobs and Skills Package, the SGUJS. Ministry of Finance has set aside an additional $5.4 billion to support the hiring of 200,000 local locals through the Jobs Growth Incentive, JGI, and provided 35,000 traineeships, attachment and training opportunities just this year alone. These programmes are in addition to long-standing programmes such as Workforce Singapore's WSG's Career Conversion programmes. And to make our career matching services even more accessible to locals, WSG has set up 20, in 24 HDB towns this SGU JSCs, that means the SG United Jobs and Skills Centres in all 24 HDB towns. The Retrenchment Task Force, led by WSG and supported by NTUC's E2I, reached out to nearly all retrenched workers in 2020. And of those who took up the Task Force Employment Facilitation Assistance, you'd be happy to note that more than two-thirds of them have found jobs within six months. Ms. Mariam Jaffa asked about the effectiveness of the different capability development schemes in building a local talent pipeline. As of end April 2021, more than 110,000 locals have been placed 
into jobs and skills opportunities as a result of the SG UJS package. Within the first three months of implementation, the Jobs Growth Incentive supported 27,000 employers who hired 130,000 new locals. With the support of employers and the unions, the policies that we have put up have preserved jobs for Singaporeans amidst the crisis of our generation. The numbers speak for themselves. Total employment in 2020, excluding migrant domestic workers, shrank by 166,600. Foreign employment took the most hit, shrinking by 181,500. Resident employment, on the other hand, managed to expand by 14,900 in spite of the downturn. We are not quite out of the woods yet, and there is more work to be done. But, ladies and gentlemen, let us also build on what we have collectively achieved so far. A second part on safeguarding diversity. I want to talk about nationality concentration amongst foreign PMEs. Mr. Leong and Ms. Pua have asked for the nationality profile of our work pass holders and their dependents from China, from India, from the US and from Australia. Ms. Pua has asked for even more granular data on the sector and jobs commonly held by these same nationalities. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, for foreign policy reasons, we do not publish detailed statistics on our foreign workforce, especially by nationality. And I'm not aware of any country that reports at that level of granularity requested. But nevertheless, we recognise that if misconceptions continue to spread in spite of all of our attempts to address them in many other ways, even more damage will be done. So I will share some numbers to address the misconceptions and allow for meaningful engagement on the issue at hand. The top nationalities that comprise around two-thirds of our EP holders has been consistent since 2005, namely China, India, Japan, Malaysia, Philippines and the UK. I believe the interest is really in Indian EP holders. The proportion of EP holders from India has increased from about one-seventh in 2005 to about a quarter in 2020. In comparison, the proportion of EP holders from China has remained relatively stable across this same time period. Now, is this the result of more favourable treatment for Indian EP holders due to seeker? The answer is no. As I've shared earlier, all work pass holders in Singapore have to meet the same criteria before they are allowed to enter our, local, our labour market. There is no differentiation based on nationality. Rather, these numbers reflect trends in the global demand and supply of tech talent. The larger increase in, in Indian EP holders compared to other nationalities is driven by a result of rapid growth and choices of growing our digital economy and finance. As every sector seeks to be digitally enabled, their need for tech talent has grown significantly. We don't have enough locals to fill the jobs available. In the Infocom sector alone today, 6,000 jobs currently remain unfilled. Companies can decide which overseas countries they want to bring in their manpower from based on their needs and the availability of the required talent. China and India, over the last decade or so, are two of the largest suppliers of tech talent. But you would have read, China has sprouted so many unicorns. And they have, I mean, you know, the PRC companies themselves have a huge demand of their own. So many Chinese talent decide to stay in China to work. And I can tell you that this is the numbers that we are seeing across the construction industry amongst the migrant workers as well. I think prior to my coming on board as Manpower Minister, I think many members here would know that I, I deal with the DOMS most of the time. So I can share with you the same statistics. 
Now, India's talent, on the other hand, they've continued to look outwards. They've also the advantage of being English-speaking. Now, this phenomenon is not unique to Singapore. It is global. Today, currently, sorry, India is the largest country of origin for international migrants. And this is in the 2021 January UN uh, DESA report. In 2020 alone, it accounted for 18 million international migrants, up by 10 million from 2000. India has grown to become the second largest source of immigrants in the US, the third largest in the UK, and these two countries are also heavily invested in developing the technological capabilities. Now, our companies, our industries, our enterprises, they are both creators, they as well as they are creators of technology, but they are also adopters of the talent that is needed to create these technologies. Given our relative shortage of manpower, even if the workers don't come from India, they will come from somewhere else. Now, I hope that Mr. Leong is not objecting to Indians per se. The point I think we should ask ourselves is this. Are they helping our companies? Are they helping our enterprises? Are they helping us to grow our economy and create better Singaporean jobs? The answer is yes. It is not surprising, however, that this increasing concentration has caused some social frictions and anxiety to Singaporeans. In some ways, this is understandable. And to some, we may even say that it's expected because these EP holders are transient. They work in Singapore for a number of years and they contribute to our economic growth. Apart from some EP holders who settle down and become PRs or Singapore citizens, most of them, most EP holders work here for a few years and they either return home or they move on elsewhere. So it is to be expected that they are different and we do feel that they are different. And this is the challenge of living in our multicultural society and a globalised world, as Minister Lawrence Wong spoke about recently. This is something that we will have to proactively and we have been constantly monitoring and managing. Indeed, when a single nationality becomes too prominent and that can have a disproportionate impact on our existing culture, our beliefs, it can cause our fellow Singaporeans, ourselves included, to feel less at home in our workplaces and in our neighbourhoods. In, in the early 2000s, we experienced a similar situation when the share of PRCs in our foreign workforce increased significantly before tapering as China's growth took off. Both then and now, the larger numbers do not go, uh, did not go unnoticed and they created frictions within our communities. We understand these concerns, which is why we review and we update our work pass policies regularly. We always seek to balance the needs of our economy with the needs of our society. We have to bring in the talent and the skills to keep our economy growing while tracking that the number of foreigners in our midst stays at a level that we are able to cope with and manage the social frictions that will arise from time to time. Now, this is a series of trade-offs. It is not going to be a once-off adjustment. It will be a constant balance that we have to continuously monitor and get right. Today, the government does monitor the concentration of nationalities at the firm level. Mr. Leong asked whether the threshold percentage of a company's workforce from a single nationality is a criterion for the Fair Consideration Framework or FCF watch list. The answer is yes. In shortlisting firms, Manpower Ministry looks at whether they have a high concentration of foreigners from a single nationality source, in addition to a high source of foreign PMETs relative to their industry peers. However, being flagged in the FCF watch list is not evidence that the firm has committed any wrongdoing. Potentially, it could be a sign that some unfair hiring may be occurring. 
The purpose of this watch list is to have the tripartite alliance for fair and progressive employment practices or TAFEP actively engage these companies to review and improve where needed their hiring practices and their human resource capabilities. The majority of the firms are cooperative. They respond positively and they exit the watch list. Now, for the small minority that are unresponsive, they can have their work pass privileges curtailed or they can be suspended for a specific time period. And this is not a small penalty. Today, this is an effective process, albeit intense, uh, resource intensive. We currently have about 400 firms placed on the FCF watch list. Now, there are limitations in terms of the, to the reach and the number of firms that we can put through this process. We will be looking to complement, to strengthen the FCF watch list with a more scalable approach. As mentioned in MAM's Committee of Supply speech this year, we are also exploring further refinements to our EP framework. Today, we rely primarily on salary as a gatekeeper to select complementary talent because this is easy to understand and administer. But we are also exploring further refinements, further additional refinements to achieve our objectives of a strong Singaporean core, complemented by a diverse foreign workforce. I hope to share more details in due course. Last but not least, I want to deal with discrimination. We know not all employers play by the rules. We have zero tolerance, zero tolerance towards discriminatory hiring practices. All employers are expected to comply with the requirements of the FCF and not discriminate on characteristics that are not related to the job. When it comes to hiring foreign PMEs, employers must first advertise on mycareersfuture.sg and consider all candidates in the local workplace fairly before submitting a work pass application. TAFEP investigates potential cases of pre-selection based on proactive surveillance. We use data analytics and AI as well to, to, to find out. So we actually sort of uh, study the data uh, quite, quite uh, um, aggressively. So we also receive complaints from the public and we act on them as well. Since its introduction in 2014, the Ministry of Manpower has been progressively enhancing this framework. In January 2020, we stiffened penalties further for discrimination cases so that errant employers can have their work pass privileges suspended for at least 12 months and sometimes up to 24 months. Last year, we extended the FCF job advertisement requirements to cover S passes as well as EPs and we doubled the minimum advertisement period from 14 days to 28 days to give local job seekers more time to respond to job openings. Mr. Liang has asked, Mr. Liang Inghua has asked about the results of our efforts. Over the past three years, TAFEP has handled an average of 170 nationality discrimination cases arising from complaints annually. The top three sectors making up about half of the complaints are the wholesale and retail trade, administrative and support services, and other service activities. These cases are investigated by TAFEP and where warranted, they are referred to MOM for enforcement. Going forward, we will do more to clamp down on egregious employers with discriminatory employment practices. Several MPs like Mr. Louis Ng, Mr. Patrick Tay and Mr. Vikram Nair had earlier suggested strengthening our levers to give more bite to our tripartite guidelines on fair employment practices. We take these suggestions seriously and we have been studying various options. Ladies and gentlemen, on a fundamental level, the government's goal has always been to create a better life and a future for Singaporeans. We do that through growing the economy, 
through enlarging the pie so that more locals can enjoy better jobs and a higher standard of living. We do that by tirelessly building up the Singaporean core through a world-class education system, through continuous upskilling and reskilling. And we do that through working closely with all stakeholders involved to stamp out discriminatory employment practices and ensure a fair playing field to protect our Singaporean workers. There are careful balances and trade-offs to be made all the time. The government is intent on keeping this balance right to achieve the goal of, achieve, of creating win-win outcomes for all. Mum will always be pro, both pro-worker and pro-business, and this is necessarily a joint effort. The power and the responsibility to make this happen does not lie with the government alone. Businesses must be fair and progressive employers. They must win the confidence and the trust of their employees and the wider public by investing in a strong Singaporean core, even as they complement it with a diverse foreign workforce. Workers, too, must adopt a growth mindset and continuously develop their skills. This is the spirit of our pioneers, who are resilient in the face of challenges and daring in new opportunities. Unions and trade associations and chambers or TACs must continue to serve as multipliers of these positive changes. They help us, they help to build the bridge between government and businesses and workers, and they have spearheaded important initiatives to help our businesses and workers transform and upskill. And I hope members of all parties take their responsibility, they must take their responsibility as representatives of the people seriously and work towards constructive solutions and avoid exploiting divisive fault lines. The tripartite partnership between unions, employers and the government is the real reason why we have managed to succeed over the years. We are at a critical inflection point in our economic development. The pandemic has caused significant economic damage the world over. We face many challenges in the post-pandemic era, but there are also abundant opportunities if we play our cards right. We have distinguished ourselves internationally with how we manage COVID and we have enhanced our trust premium. Many businesses are now looking seriously at investing more in Singapore, which will create good jobs, but only if they get, can get enough workers foreign workers as well, to supplement our local workforce. If we can bring them in, we can continue to grow our economy for another five to ten years. But if we lose this opportunity, we will not only take longer to recover, the impact will be borne by our older workers and also by our youths who will graduate into the workforce over the next few years. This is a golden opportunity for Singapore to pull ahead. But if we turn protectionist and we make it difficult for companies to hire talent from around the world, then we will lose this opportunity. A business hub means being cosmopolitan, having people from around the world, doing business with the whole world and creating more opportunities for Singaporeans. It will bring in competition, but if the competition is not here, it will be outside. The competition will be in helping other companies in other countries to beat ours here and displace our workers. Let us work together to continue improving Singaporeans' lives and building a better future for all. Mr. Speaker, sir, can I just uh, take a couple more minutes in Mandarin, please? Singapore's <laughs> 一直以国人作为中心我们也更帮助了许许多多的本地企业 
，特别是专项或新兴领域的公司，难免需要吸引、要引进当地的专才来补充新加坡员工可能还没发展或暂时缺乏的技能。但这些外界专业人士所带来的专项技能，在公司起步和发展的过程中，都可以转移给新加坡员工。假以时日，新加坡员工就能够掌握新的技能，提高他们的竞争力，步步高升。这些外界专业人士给我们国人在求职、就业上造成了了一定的压力，这是我能够理解的。一些国人或许在应征工作的时候，感到竞争比以前、比过去更加激烈。又或者是认为自己受到不平等的待遇，也有一些国人可能担心，我们新加坡的社会结构会不会出现了变化？我很明白国人的担忧。就此，政府在推动经呃经济持续发展的时候，我们一定会继续保障我们国人的生计，这是我们铁定的承诺。对此。我们推行的政策从两大两大方面会着手。首先，我们会确保国人继续掌掌握中啊、呃、掌握好的工作机会。在过去几年，我们逐步收紧了外界呃员工的配额，特别是在 S 准证方面。去年，我们还两度调高了就业准证的薪金门槛，以确保企业引进的是。外界专才。与此同时，我们也大力投资于国人，确保他们在国际市场上保持竞争的优势，能够闯出一片天。其次，保障新加坡人在职场上受到公平对待，我们更新了公平考量框架，加重对围猎雇主的惩罚。人力部也正在探讨如何进一步的改善我们就业准证的框架。所所谓，人生可是啊、呃，可比是海上的波浪，有时起，有时落。好运、坏运，总是要照着功来行。Somehow it, it, it sounds different when I speak in Mandarin. You know? You're supposed to to to, to sing it in Hokkien. You know? 多年来。I think even Mr. Pritam Singh knows that it's a Hokkien song. <laughs> 多年来，新加坡人，新加坡人经历了不少风风雨雨，遇到任何挑战都都从不低头。毕竟 ，OK，I、okay, I, I cannot resist it. 毕竟，爱表家呀。<laughs> 面临这场疫情的危机，国人秉持“先辈无私奉献，能屈能伸”的新加坡精神，这表明了新加坡人是能够刻苦耐劳。但是我们在乎的是要得到公平的待遇的对待，这得要靠多方面的努力和配合。公司企业要继续创新，要继续转型，打造能够吸引更加多新加坡人的工作。国人应不断的提升他们自己的技能，对工作机遇保持开放的心态。政府会给予。各方面的援助，帮助国人度过难关，维持一个公平而公正的社会。我们这一年来都在努力面对抗疫情所带来的种种挑战。这时候，我希望大家我们更加要团结一致，发扬我们新加坡精神。政府会与国人同甘共苦，同舟共济，遇强。遇强，走出困境，创造一个美好的未啊美好的未来。谢谢大家。Mr. Ong, Mr. Speaker, sir, pursuant to Standing Order Number Forty Four, I beg to move that the two ministerial statements made by me and Minister for Manpower on Free Trade Agreements and Foreign Manpower be considered by Parliament. 
Question is, are the two ministerial statements made by Minister for Health and Minister for Manpower on Free Trade Agreements and Foreign Manpower be considered by Parliament? Proceed with the debate. Clarifications, speeches? Mr. Patrick Day. Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank our both ministers for their statements and wish to provide my comments, clarifications and suggestions on this sensitive and important topic which concerns Singaporean workers, especially our professionals, managers and executives. I co-chair the NTUC SNEF PME Task Force set up by NTUC last year to look into the concerns of PMEs and to flesh out a set of recommendations later this year in relation to employment and employability of PMEs in Singapore. In the past six months, we have surveyed and engaged through more than 15 focus group sessions about 8,000 professionals, managers and executives to better understand their concerns, fears and anxiety and ideate proposals to overcome them. We have heard ground sentiments on a plethora of issues, challenges faced by Singaporean PMEs. On the top of their mind, is job security amidst this COVID-19 pandemic. One concern, amongst others, which was surfaced is the intense competition from the influx of foreign manpower and anecdotes of unfair employment practices by employers who favour hiring foreigners and discriminate against our locals. Some PMEs share with us their personal experiences of foreign hiring managers bringing in co-workers of the same nationality while others have shared about disguised discriminatory practices at work, where they felt ostracised when their foreign colleagues who form majority of the team communicate in their native language at work and through the unfair allocation of off days given to their foreign colleagues during public holidays by their supervisors of the same nationality. While it is clear only a minority engages in such unacceptable practices, the concerns are legitimate and we should not ignore it. PMEs I spoke to acknowledge the need for FTAs and foreign manpower in this age of globalisation, global competition and economic survival and success. But we must recognise the need to support our local workforce's aspirations and to address their concerns and anxieties. One Singaporean PME who is an Asia-Pacific sales director, as well as many other PMEs in those sectors with a higher proportion of foreign PMEs, such as the financial, ICT and professional services sectors, shared with me that we should not allow the import of non-specialised and non-highly skilled foreign manpower to compete against Singaporeans for well-paying jobs, which many Singaporeans can do. I think this principle of complementarity and not direct competition is an important concept which we need to continue to embrace and strengthen. In other words, we need to strike a balance between being open and having a level playing field for our locals with fair opportunities and fair treatment. This balance is not easy to achieve and it's going to be an involving process. Together with fellow Labour and PAP MPs, I've been speaking and lobbying on this important area in and outside of this House the past decade to ensure fairness, equity and levelling the playing field, especially for our Singaporean PMEs. Since 2011, I've been pushing for a stronger enforcement against employers who discriminate against or unfairly treat Singaporean PMEs, a foreign PME dependency ratio, labour market testing which subsequently came in the form of the Fair Consideration Framework, the National Jobs Bank as well as many other policy measures from employment past qualifying salaries to regular tightening of the FCF and the prosecution of companies who are recalcitrant. We even set up the Employment Claims Tribunal, the Tropolite Alliance for Fair Employment Practices, as well as the Tropolite Alliance for Disputes Management, and issued many Tropolite advisories, standards, guidelines to strengthen the Singaporean core. I'm heartened that in these past 10 years of lobbying and advocating for a stronger Singaporean core, many of these measures have been put in place, as shared by Minister Tan Siling earlier, 
with support of our tripartite partners and other economic agencies such as MAS and EDB to better support and protect our Singaporean workforce and provide them with a fair and level playing field in the job market. In fact, less than a year ago, in the midst of the pandemic and worsening of the economy, the Labour movement lobbied and the tripartite partners reacted and updated the tripartite advisory on managing excess manpower and responsible retrenchment with key principles on fair retrenchment, which provides added safeguards to preserve our Singaporean core in our companies when they carry out retrenchment exercises. That said, more needs to be done to strengthen the Singaporean core, further develop our local workforce's capabilities and protect our locals from being unfairly discriminated. It is important to recognise the role that foreign manpower plays, which is to complement and enhance the capabilities of the local workforce and not to replace or displace it. In this vein, I would like to put forth some proposals to the Minister that aims to address fairness and localisation of PME jobs. First, we can enhance fair hiring practices through strengthening enforcement and imposing stiffer penalties for erring companies with discriminatory hiring practices. I previously submitted in this House on revealing or even publishing the triple week watch list which the Ministry of Manpower and TAFEP maintains so that the potential reputational loss would serve as a deterrence. We should not allow a few black sheep to weaken our entire working structure. I further submit that MOM should consider giving TAFEP even more teeth and bite through expanded powers of investigation, enforcement and even meeting out punishment. Second, we can level the playing field for local PMEs by enhancing the EP application review process to move beyond looking at individual applicants' educational qualification and salaries and play close watch, pay close watch to sectors with particular imbalance. Finally, we need to ensure that locals have fair access to PME roles and progression opportunities to improve localization of jobs in high growth sectors. As I have lobbied before in this House, it is imperative that we ensure concerted, structured, institutionalised and mandatory skills and knowledge transfer from these foreign PMEs to our local PMEs within a stipulated and agreed time frame. As employers bring in foreign PMEs to fill skills or knowledge gaps in their current workforce. This will help to develop a pipeline of local talent. And at the same time, we will also need to build our leadership bench strength to ensure that Singaporeans can benefit and take up leadership roles in multinational corporations that we bring into Singapore. To sum up, to say that we have found the silver bullet or antidote will not be an easy one as it's going to be a treadmill journey, a treadmill. We need to constantly watch our step, keep pace and stay in touch with the pulse. Pay close watch of the economic competition and competitors keep pace with the changing demographic profile and the future of work, and stay in touch with the pulse and heartbeat of Singaporeans, their stresses, aspirations, interests and well-being, because every worker matters. Thank you. Professor Hun Hyun Thank Mr. Speaker, sir, an issue that has surfaced in the debate on free trade agreements, FTAs, such as the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement, SICA, is that of their impact on jobs. It is important to state at the outset that the number of jobs in an economy is not an immutable datum. Rather, it is variable and it is the result of the net effect of the pace of job creation, which adds to the number of job vacancies, and the pace of job destruction, which reduces the number of job vacancies. In the first few decades after gaining independence, 
The world trading system under the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, steadily reduced tariff rates and lowered trade barriers. The World Trade Organization, WTO, was established in 1995 as a multilateral institution that facilitated the signing of agreements in areas such as services, investment, and intellectual property. This enabled the Singapore economy to attract multinational corporations, MNCs, to base production in Singapore, thus creating jobs and sell into the world market. With increased protectionist sentiments expressed in many advanced countries in recent years, so that the WTO has had difficulty in reaching new agreements, it has been necessary for Singapore to turn to FTAs to provide a means to enlarge markets for Singapore-based firms. By negotiating and signing FTAs that enable our firms to export to destination markets at lower or zero tariff rates, Singapore can attract foreign capital to work in Singapore to employ Singapore-based workers and pull up their wages. With Singapore's total fertility rate consistently below the replacement rate of 2.1 since the mid-1970s, the size of the citizen labour force will begin to shrink with more people retiring than the number of new entrants into the workforce. A shrinking workforce will put downward pressure on GDP growth because productivity growth is unlikely to fully compensate for the labour force shrinkage. Singapore's rise in living standards over the past decades has been facilitated by a steady inflow of foreign direct investment, which brought technology and good jobs. So continuing to attract multinational corporations to base their production here, even as we become more service-oriented, the manufacturing hiring a smaller share of labour force, yet doing this is likely to require a complementary set of skills that can be offered only by a combination of local and foreign workers, given the low fertility rate. At this stage of our development, where indigenous innovation must contribute to productivity growth, FTAs also allow new startups and both large and local enterprises, LLEs, as well as small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, to face lower trade barriers when selling into particular overseas markets. So we continue to need to rely on MNCs because they are large, they pay better wages, but we're also at a stage where we need to stimulate indigenous innovation. And they'll start small, many will fail, but they need to have the capacity to be able to sell abroad. And therefore, establishing FTAs that allow the partner signatories to the agreement to lower their tariff rates and enlarges the market for our new startups and SMEs, as well as LLEs. The increased international competition, to be clear, uh, faced by our local firms also means there will be some job destruction because with increased competition, some of our SMEs may fail. Nevertheless, the creative destruction resulting from FTAs is likely to leave the economy overall with more productive firms that are able to pay better wages. So it's stiffer competition. Some will not survive and they have to try again but overall, for the economy, the level of productivity is higher as we seek to generate indigenous innovation as a source of our productivity growth. So FTAs are helpful both from the point of view of continuing to attract MNCs to place their the production here, but it is also important as a way of giving a lift to our more productive local firms, SMEs, to break into potentially neighbouring markets and further overseas. The derived demand for workers resulting from the need to meet this external demand for our goods and services by foreign firms and consumers in the partner countries 
who are signatories of the FTAs, will translate into the creation of new job slots with particular tasks. Because what is a job? A job is a combination of tasks that we create. So the allocation of workers with the right skill set to fill these job slots with this particular set of tasks is necessary in order to maximize this Singapore-based firm's profit. Only then is productivity of the firm boosted and the salaries correspondingly increased. As the local workforce raises its human capital, because of the huge investment we have made from the beginning in education, the, the proportion of the cohort living primary school that goes to university has gone up. So I think that from the point of view of increased human capital, as well as the investment in skills future to allow learning on the job, I think there is every reason to have confidence that our local workforce will both have a higher level of human capital as well as have the ability to acquire new skills to function in an age of digital transformation. If we succeed in doing that, then our resident workers will have the comparative advantage to fill these new job slots, the sort of thing that Mr. Patrick uh, Tay talked about. So, so I think going back to Mr. Ong's analogy, A, of more job slots but more competition, on the other hand, less competition of future job, job slots. He talked about being somewhere in between. Then I think there's good reason, given our history. The ability to ultimately compete in the world market says there's something positive about tilting toward the direction of increased competition. But we make investment in our local workforce, starting from the primary school. And there's every good reason to believe that even as we transit to a phase of, of, of the country's development where you're not going to have the 5% growth per year, because that was catch-up growth. We are now at a stage where the potential for growth has to come from innovation driving productivity. I believe that there's every good reason to think that ultimately many of these jobs that our locals take they graduate from a university, they perhaps start off with an M in an MNC at a lower managerial position, but with the, the, the sort of human capital, with the sort of ability to adjust and compete, there's every good reason to believe that many of them, on their own merits, have the potential to fill in these new job slots, because there's local advantage. Mr. Speaker, sir, to conclude, in the absence of a vibrant international trading system that can conclude new agreements to further liberalise trade in goods and services, I believe that the signing of FTAs overall provides the Singapore economy a means for its firms to expand their market, despite the job churning and the creative destruction. That ultimately, I believe, has positive net, net impact for our labour market. Thank you. Sir Lewis Hung. Uh, thank you, sir. Not a speech, but just a clarification. If I could ask uh, Minister Tan whether moving forward uh, we will consider legislating the tripartite guidelines on fair employment practice. And I think that's important because it's not just discrimination based on nationality, but also on, uh, based on race, religion, gender, family responsibility, disability, amongst many others. So I really hope we will consider legislating those guidelines. Thank you. I think, um, I thank the Honourable Member uh, Lewis uh, for his suggestion. As I've um, shared in my speech earlier on, we're looking at refining, we're looking at um, strengthening um, the, not just TAFAB itself, but also the Fair Consideration Framework itself. Uh, give us a bit of time. I think we're reviewing it with the, the, the different um, parties because it's a tripartite nature. Um, and uh, in the months uh, forward, um, I should be able to come back and update this house again. Thank you. Ms. Hazel Poir.
Um, I thank the two ministers for their ministerial statements, providing a wide range of information and explanation, and for this additional opportunity for us to seek clarifications on an issue that is of, uh, that is of great concern to many Singaporeans. Um, I will, an open debate based on the right information can only be beneficial to all parties involved, whether in or out of this house. I'd like to seek a few clarifications. The first one relates to Minister Ong's claim that um, PSP has made false allegations that uh, Sika is allowing a free flow of Indian PMEs. Uh, can I ask the minister to provide the specifics of this uh, false allegations that he mentioned, uh, including details like um, when and where and who. He gave partial quotes, but um, partial quotes can be taken out of context. And if he can provide the specifics, we can look into it further. Um, secondly, uh, Minister Ong said that at the beginning of his statement that um, he would be happy to provide all information that we request for in order to have a more robust debate on the motion subsequently. Um, but at the end of the, minister, the two ministerial statements, unfortunately, uh, the bulk of the information that we have requested for in our nine parliamentary questions are not released. Um, so will there be any more data forthcoming in the form of written answers? Um, thirdly, now we agree that FTAs are important to Singapore's economy and we're not calling for the abolition of FTAs. Our concern is over specific provisions in FTAs relating to the movement of natural persons. Um, in, in SICA, um, just now Minister Ong mentioned that the, the listing of the 127 professions does not mean that anybody who applies under this will be approved, but it can be rejected even if they apply. Um, I, now, Article 9.5, Clause 2, under the heading of professional states that each party shall grant temporary entry and stay for up to a year. Uh, and it goes on to list several conditions. So my question here is because it says shall grant temporary entry and stay for up to a year. Um, if an applicant meets the criteria that is listed in this clause, namely proof of nationality, uh, letter of contract or similar documentation, educational certificates, or similar documentation, as well as the minimum salary requirements for EPAS. For anybody who satisfies these conditions, are we obliged to approve their application? And fourthly, uh, under this clause, the en temporary entry and stay is up to one year. I would like to seek clarification, can this uh, entry and stay be further extended or renewed or reapplied. Thank you. Mr. Ong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, let me try to answer the honourable members' four questions. I hope I got them all correct. Uh, proof of the allegations of PSP, 3rd of August 2019, Dr. Tan Cheng Bok, I think he was sec gen then, of PSP, stated on the Online Citizen Asia Facebook page, I quote, PSP will call for a review of the India-Singapore Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement known as SICA. This agreement, you must understand, was negotiated by our current DPM, Heng Sui Kiet, and signed in 2005. Amongst the terms of the SICA, it allowed the free movement of professionals in 127 sectors to enter and work in Singapore." Unquote. 7 July 2020, Dr. Tan, in an interview with Mothership, said, I quote, SICA is an agreement between Singapore and India to bring in, to allow, I think, 127 categories of professionals to come to Singapore and be given that free hand, actually, practically free hand, to come and work here, unquote. 31st August 2020, Mr. Francis Yuan, on the PSP Facebook page and website, 
He urged the government to release more data on the matter, which is fair enough, but then went on to state that the government, I quote, could not share the next level of details, including the number of Indian nationals converted to PR and those who subsequently gotten citizenships within the eight years under the intra-corporate transfer provision of the agreement. I think that, unquote, and then that agreement start to suggest that they come in and then become PR and citizens as well. Most recently, 22nd June 2021, in a Facebook post, Mr. Leong Man Wai said, the most important economic policies that have affected the jobs and livelihoods of Singaporeans relate to foreign PMEs and free trade agreements, in particular, a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with India. Um, as members of the public, as members of the House, we were also or members of public using our handphones, we would also have received many other unattributable divisive messages coming through our feeds and chat messages. And I think these quotes uh, and all these messages you receive if you are Singaporeans, especially one facing challenges at the workplace, feeling insecure, you're bound to feel upset and angry. You're bound to feel that I, I don't want to welcome foreign PMEs. You will grow suspicious of them, even reject them. And it will be a natural reaction because the messages feed on our worries and our fears. We have seen how this has turned out in so many other countries, how the extreme right, nativist, populist parties have grown in strength just by tapping into that fear and insecurity because of globalization is there. But these far-right nationalist parties or nativist parties, they have been growing stronger in many places around the world and created divisions in societies Sometimes they have replaced the government who take a more moderate policy. And I really hope that it doesn't happen here because if it happens in Singapore, as it happened elsewhere, our policies, our politics would have gone disastrously wrong. Um, Ms. Hazel Paul said that I promised to give all the data they requested. We tried, we tried our best. But as Dr. Tan Siling explained, no countries release data to that level of granularity. But if I just go back to my speech, what I said is, Dr. Tan will provide more details, detailed answers to the specific questions, including providing the data which will be useful for our subsequent debate and putting that data in context. I, I didn't promise that all the data will be tabulated and provided. And Dr. Tan explained why we try to provide as much as we can, but I think there's a limit to what we can do. Um, Ms. Hazel Pa also asked about Article 9. Article 9, as a trade negotiator, you always look up. Sorry. Chapter, chapter 9, I'm sorry. Chapter 9 of SICA. As a trade negotiator, we always look out for the word shell. <clears throat> and here, when you see shell, means you must do something. You don't do, you are in breach of the agreement. So, what is the shell here? You shall grant temporary entry and stay up to one year for the duration of contract. That's what we agreed to. That means if we approve, if you meet our condition, work past conditions, we shall grant you one year of admission. I think it's very reasonable. Imagine you apply for something for the government, and then they tell you, I approve, but I don't know how long. Tomorrow, revoke. Can't be. Uh, it's not, not market friendly at all. So this is what we have agreed to. Remember, the ordering of the clauses matter as well. I was mentioning page one. I printed a copy. I highlighted it. Second paragraph, third paragraph are what I call the carve outs. So carve outs come in the beginning. You read this chapter, you know that this chapter does not apply to immigration measures. Government's policy on immigration, on the granting work pass, granting PR, granting citizenship, does not cover this chapter. And then it goes on to say, what then the government, what then the parties must do? So you shall grant one year of approval, should you approve. That's how you read the agreement. Uh, I hope I have answered all this Hazel Pass question, but I do have some question too for PSB, if I may ask. I left my papers there, I'm going to pick it up. I, I tried to correct the falsehoods of Sika. Um, 
But the whole purpose of this statement is that I know PSP is preparing for a motion debate, but I'm also hoping that we all go into the debate with some common ground. Yeah. And I think, first of all, common ground must be let's put aside the falsehoods. And therefore, I clarified which are the falsehoods and let's put them aside and don't bring them into the motion. What are the first falsehoods? First, Sika does not allow a free flow of intra corporate transferees to Singapore. And most companies prefer to apply for EPs than to use the intra corporate transferee route, which actually is more cumbersome. And hence, I mentioned as of 2020, there were only 500 intra corporate transferees from, Singapore in, uh, from India in Singapore. Second falsehood. Sika also does not give Indian nationals from 127 professions a free hand to come to Singapore to live and work. Sika allows them to apply for EPs. It does not oblige Singapore to approve the applications. Approval is subject to them meeting our criteria. Immigration measures are carved out from the agreement, like all FTAs. But in the spirit of seeking common ground, we come to this house, the floor, and we recognize that globalization is a difficult thing. There are lots of pros, there's also cons. In the case of Singapore, globalization has allowed us to grow, to create a lot of good jobs, and benefited many Singaporeans. If we have not done that, today we will be having a very different kind of debate of massive unemployment, of stagnating wages, graduates, not being able to find jobs. But we also recognize there are downsides, and there are two social downsides other than the increased competition. First, while foreign EP holders have come in to help us sustain our growth, and though the growth in local PMEs outnumbered that of foreign EP holders, the presence of foreign EPs have nevertheless created more competition, discomfort, and social issues, and we must manage this. And second, Singaporeans want to know that they will be given fair treatment at the workplace. It is entirely justified. And we have rules to achieve such fairness. And we will continually review these rules and framework, how they are implemented, to ensure that fairness is assured. So this is what the government part have done in the spirit of trying to achieve some common ground as we go into to, to the debate. So may I ask the PSP, our two honourable NCMPs from the PSP. After hearing all the explanation from Dr. Tan and I, will you agree to the following? First, the FTAs, including SICA, are fundamental to Singapore's economic survival and our ability to earn a living. And we should not shake this bedrock for political purposes. Second, SICA does not allow a free flow of Indian PMEs into Singapore. And this is a gross misunderstanding of the agreement and FTAs in general. Nor is SICA the cause of the challenges faced by our PMEs. And we must spot, put a stop to the spreading of the falsehoods. And if you agree to this, and I think we have a good chance to have some common ground that we come into the House again for a debate on the motion, we can have a meaningful and constructive debate. If I may seek the clarifications of our two members from PSP, please. Sigamon Wai. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, um, Minister Ong Yikang, for the clarifications on our position. And also thanks, uh, 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 Minister Ong Yikang and Minister Tan Siling, for a detailed explanation of the uh, situation on foreign PMETs, foreign manpower, and the uh, free trade agreements, and SECA. As to Dr. Uh, sorry, as to uh, uh, Minister Ong Yi Khan's uh, questions, I will leave it to the last, or we will leave it to be answered 
you know, uh, in the debate that we are going to conduct uh, later on. But there are a few things I like to uh, uh, bring out here, or a few questions I like to ask to clarify the situation further. One, we are not against FTAs. We know the importance of FTA for Singapore as an open economy and especially as a small city state. However, what we are concerned is what price we are paying. So one of the so the first question I want to ask is that in the process of negotiating an FT, a FTA, what is our position? What are the bargaining positions that we can give? Because I read things like, because we don't have much, uh, many uh, bargaining chips, so we have to be, the implication is that we may have to be, may, we may have to be a bit more relaxed with the movement of people. So one qualification, one question I want to ask is that, are the movement of people or natural persons used as one of the bargaining chip when we are negotiating the FTA? Excuse me, I need some water. The whole purpose of the PSP and Hazel and I to bring up the issue about foreign manpower or foreign PMETs or foreign talent, whatever term we used, and the FTAs, it is about people's, Singaporeans' jobs and livelihood. So when PSP, Dr. Tan Cheng Bok, raised the issue at the August 2019 launch of the PSB party. It is due to the huge amount of feedback that we got from the ground. By raising the issue, we had hoped it would get some response from the government to explain more about what are FTAs, in particular, SECA. Okay. Indeed, you would admit that no other FTA has given and stated specifically that 127 professions can come into work. You may say that, oh, no one has come in through the SECA route, but the clause is there. It is up to the other party whether they want to use it or not. And most importantly, up to our government to administer our employment policies. Because our employment policies are already quite relaxed in granting work passes to foreigners. So the nationals, the Indian nationals, don't have to come into Singapore through the SECA route. So the first question I want to ask is that whether the movement of people is used as a bargaining chip. The second question I want to ask is, we should not focus just on the number of people that got into our job market through the FTA or SECA. They have provided some conditions. Most importantly is how those conditions under the FTAs interplay with our domestic employment policies. So the number to focus on is how many of the respective FTA's nationals, in the case of SECA, it's Indian nationals, have come into Singapore and take up our PMET jobs. And what is the share of that as a percentage of our total 
or, or the foreign PMETs, and then our total PMET jobs? That is the second question. The next point I want to bring out or question that I want to ask is that the government has admitted that something needs to be done. There are concerns by Singaporeans regarding jobs and livelihood. So, but this thing has been going on and on. Has sufficient measures been taken? to address all this. One of the things I want to ask is, has the government actually tried to find out what is the total number of displaced Singaporeans? I would think that you can't deny that there are Singaporeans who are displaced. Your narrative is that, oh, they are all because they don't have the skills. Let's not push the blame to the universities and the polytechnics so easily. It has been 20 years since we started the foreign talent policy. Within 20 years, we still haven't got our act together in training our people. That is the third question. What is the total number of Singaporeans that are displaced over the last 10 years? They would like to have the, the, the job taken up by a foreigner, but he was not able to, he lost the job, he lost his current job, and when he, to, when he get into another job, he got lower pay. And there are a significant number of Singaporeans who are underemployed. You look at the growth of the grab drivers, the growth of the, uh, um, uh, our traineeship, traineeship pro program, um, and the, um, uh, many of our independent workers, Okay, are they voluntarily opting for an independent lifestyle or are they facing a difficulty in getting into a permanent job? Has the Manpower Ministry done a study on those things? Have you got the statistics? That's a third question. The fourth question is, of course we are particularly concerned about the finance and the IT sectors. Minister Tan Si Ling had given some numbers. Unfortunately, we uh, don't have enough time to digest those numbers. So we will maybe discuss that in our debate in the future. But the fourth question I want to ask is really, how many uh, 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 foreigner PMET, how many foreigners are there in our IT and, for, and our finance sectors versus the number of Singaporeans and PRs? That's the fourth question. I think Minister might have given some figures just now. Yeah. The fifth question is, you say that we are not competitive. Singaporeans are not competitive. But Mr. Leong, I would urge you to stick to the facts. I think we've all been participation, participating in this debate and listening intently, so I do suggest that you keep to what has been said. A lot of questions have been answered as well. So the idea of the debate is to debate the issues that have been raised. So please do that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, um, I'm raising questions. So, am I, uh, can you be more so specific? You are free to, to raise questions. Some of these points have been covered. So, we'll be happy to take the time to debate whatever that's meaningful, but please make it meaningful. I, I don't understand what you mean by meaningful, because I'm, I'm going through those points. Um, okay, okay, never mind, I'll, I'll try. Okay, the fifth question is, The MOM okay, has been, we have this, again, we have this uh, foreign talent policy for 20 years. But if you look at the way MOM has administered and regulate the flow of foreign 
PMETs into Singapore, you find that the policies, of course, over time, there's a bit of tightening at a time. But generally, it seems to be too little and too late. For example, the foreign talent policy has started in the late 90s or around the year 2000. But the fair consideration framework was only introduced in 2014. And then only in 2016, I was told, you have started the fair consideration framework watch list. You mean that one and a half decades before that, there were no problems at all? And the threshold salaries that you have, just EP alone, up to 2020 last year, it was still $3,600. At that kind of threshold salary plus no CPF, do you think we are attracting the right foreign talent in the Singapore? That is my fourth, uh, fifth question. My sixth, sixth question is, I totally agree with Minister Tan Si Ling about what we are driving at is not abolishing things. It's not totally eradicating things. We are also talking about a rebalancing. But the rebalancing cannot come as a result of a natural attrition from COVID. There must be a policy recognition that whether our past foreign policy, our foreign talent policy, was on the right track or not. If we review the policy and we think that, oh, there are certain things that we need to change, then make it a policy point. Don't allow natural attrition to come by and say, oh, tens of thousands have left Singapore already. That is not the way we conduct policy. So it's about re uh, rebalancing. And, but when you talk about rebalancing, Minister Tan also said one thing is to ensure that Singaporeans can compete fairly or there's no unfair competition. And he explained that not having to pay CPF for the employment pass holder is not a disadvantage. Okay, as an employer, I respect you for your experience in the private sector, Mr. Uh, uh, Minister Tan. As an employer, isn't that a wage concession? So how can we say that Singaporeans are not being treated fair, un unfairly in the, in, in the job market competition? That is my uh, sixth question. My seventh question is, you said, Minister Tan, said that there's simply not enough local talent. Again, I will raise the point which I've said just now also. Then what happened to our education system? What happened after 20 years? You're still telling Singaporeans that we're not enough talent. We, of course, we are not saying that we can substitute the foreign, the foreign PMETs completely. But at least there can be some rebalancing. And we get back to my question just now. And if you admit that there's some displacement of Singaporeans, then that rebalancing means we must slowly allow Singaporeans to be given the first opportunity to take up the jobs first. That is my last question. Is you talk about diversity, but here again, isn't it something that the MOM should have done long ago about diversity 
in the workforce when we introduce our foreign talent policy. We also know, because we have worked in international environment before, the group dynamics at the workplace can change very fast with changes in the, the, the nationality composition in the company. So especially when the MOM is monitoring and regulating the granting of the work passes, you mean you have not, at the beginning, taken that as an important consideration? And today, then you have to say that, oh, on my uh, uh, watch list, I have uh, this number of uh, companies that have a very uh, large concentration of PMETs from a single nationality. So, so we must, we really want to understand how MOM actually administer this whole foreign PMET policy. Okay. Afterwards, maybe I will add a few more points. Uh, or I will ask a few more questions about the approval process, uh, some of the experiences I had in the private sector with regards to what, how MOM has uh, approved work passes. But my questions are these questions for now. Thank you. It's a long list of questions which I'm not sure help us bring the discussion forward. Um, let me take questions three to eight and then one to three. Yeah, three to eight is really under Ministry of Manpower, but I think let's not prolong this because as speaker I've noticed many of the questions are actually in our speeches, but if you don't accept what we say, there's very little room for us to further explain. Um, Long and short is, we have been extremely successful, and I have explained this in my ministerial statement, in growing the Singapore economy, creating this multitude of jobs. I gave examples of our port, airport, financial services, ICT, manufacturing, you name it, we are hubs of all hubs. And all this would not have been possible if we have not right on the wave of globalization, welcome foreign talent and give our own people very good training, education, to rise up and take the positions. I mentioned that our only problem is there's not enough of us. Investors come here, they want to hire Singaporeans. They know our education system is solid. And we have such a wonderful reputation around the world, something that as Singaporeans we should be proud of, a bit stressful. This education system a bit stressful still, but we should be very proud of that. But the problem is there's still not enough of us. Um, there are some questions you say we have given figures, so I, I don't think I answered those. Um, you mentioned a whole series of procedural policy, how come the fair consideration framework come in so late? Why is the bar for entry, uh, entry salary raised only later? We've been reviewing policies, MOM, successive manpower ministers have been reviewing policies all the while. Policies are never static. It worked for a period of time. Then when China, India grow, you've got a different influx of workers. You need, to have, you need to adjust your position. Then you review. And this process will continue. And we will continue to debate in this house on the pros and cons. You can't say because we implement something new now to respond to the situation, therefore we have failed. Why didn't you do it five years ago? It doesn't work like that. That's not policy making. That's not how this house works. Then every bill that's tabled in this house is, you have failed, you should have tabled this bill five years ago. It doesn't make sense. Um, but more importantly is to go back to the first three questions that you posed to me, but actually I posed to you first. Um, because Ms. Hazel Pua, actually, at one point, if I heard correctly, she said we are not against FTA, we support FTA. I, I, I thought we start to have some common ground. And then when she asked me about Chapter 9, she's not a trade negotiator, so I think those are fair questions. I have been trade negotiator for many years. I explained how the chapter ought to be read, and I hope that she asked that, I hope, is because they, you might have read the chapter wrongly. 
to think that Singapore shall allow 127 or professionals from 127 categories to enter, no question asked. After my explanation, I was hoping that she come to the conclusion that they might have interpreted the chapter wrongly. But I think after hearing Mr. Leong Man Wai, uh, I think my assumptions are all wrong. So I, let me change my question. I had two questions first, and I was hoping to hear yes. And I think first, after hearing Mr. Leong, although he said he's not against FTA, but then he went on to say that you use freedom movement of natural person as a bargaining chip and sell away uh, our rights for immigration, which I explained is untrue. So after all the explanation, you still come to that conclusion. Then I say this. Number one, PSP, you are against globalization. You are against FTA. Even though I've gone to great length to explain that this is the bedrock of Singapore's economic survival. Number two, you are really not taking back the falsehoods and the allegations. After I quoted everything, I don't think you are taking it back. You do feel that the FTA and SICA, despite our explanation, let in Indian professionals freely into Singapore. I think those are your position. Please prove me wrong, but after hearing you, I'm afraid th these are your position. Mr. Tan uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I must admit that um, uh, notwithstanding the fact that this is my first uh, ministerial statement, I, I, I find it, I mean, I actually struggle, um, you know, to, to follow uh, Mr. Leong's uh, line of reasoning. Um, I guess because of the fact that um, um, quite a number of the, the, the issues, I think he's, um, he's looking at it from uh, first and foremost a hindsight kind of a perspective itself, where why is it that you didn't do this? Why is it that we, we, we didn't do that? I think... Um, If you look at, uh, at the entire sort of uh, um, time, and I'm going to take a bit of time on this thing itself um, to try and gather my thoughts to, to, to connect his thoughts together, which, like I said, I'm, I'm struggling. So please be patient uh, with me. Um, I think what is important is that if we look at um, the evolution of our, our industry, how we started in the 70s, in, my, in the very early part of my speech, at the time we were about 20 billion uh, uh, GDP. I think we're, we're at 454 billion now. We started with a very um, conscious effort in the 70s to go and build heavy industry. So we developed Jurong Island. Um, there was all these heavy industries that we put up. Um, I think uh, uh, our pioneer um, founding generation leaders um, under uh, MM, Mr. Lee, Dr. Go and all that. I think at the time when we first started, we were very, very heavy in all these heavy industries. We went on then into manufacturing. In the 80s, we went into electronics. Uh, we did disk drives, uh, wafer fab, and then eventually we pivoted into, into um, I think in, in, in the early part of 2000, we went into uh, services, we went into biopharma, life sciences, and so on and so forth. And now we are into tech, we are into infocom, we are in finance. Now, at every 10 to 15 years, we've seen fairly dramatic transformation. I think it's inconceivable that you would expect that policies that you would enact do not get refined, do not get tweaked, and do not, do not get adjusted over time. So I, I, I guess to his point about the fact that why is it that we, we didn't do this and so on, I think in the last 15, 20 years, and he has uh, sort of pointed the fact that I've I, I've been from the private sector. Perhaps I've not been in the government long enough. Uh, uh, I, I mean, the, if anything at all, for the last 20 years, change was a constant. Change is a constant and change will be a constant. We will continually face disruption. We will face transformation. So, I mean, to his other point about why is it that we're not able to, to have all this workforce ready in spite of all of our education upgrades and so on, I think... If we all had a crystal ball 20, 30 years ago, and we could gaze so, you know, sort of uh, um, um, clearly into the future itself, um, 
perhaps even for himself. I mean, as as a as a um, as a CEO of a private equity firm, you know, I think all the necessary investments made would have been perfect and spot on. But I guess um, perhaps uh, I think hindsight, like what they always say, is, is is perfect. Now, to the other point about private sector, how we uh, package the, the the CPF into it. Indeed, I can share with you. Perhaps my experience is very limited. I, I've just been in healthcare all my life. But the fact is that, and I do admit that um, I lobbied uh, at that time, five, six years ago, for an increase in the number of S passes because of the fact that I needed to deliver a certain level of, of, of nursing care. I just couldn't hire enough of the nurses to come in and help me. And while we don't pay CPF, the cost of actually bringing them in is higher because we have to package in housing allowance and, and really because of the fact that they know the employer part of it is imputed into our costs. And I can tell you with conviction, because I've done it for many, many years in my life, that that, that package that we actually pay out is higher than what we do pay uh, locally. The only difference, of course, is the, the, the overtime charges and so on. But uh, I think that's another uh, sort of uh, thing altogether. To your point about the education system part, I just want to share one bit. In the early 2000s, our universities, our institution of higher learnings, the number of, of IT graduates that they produce at that particular point in time Today, we are actually training up four times more what we used to be training from before. The entry levels in terms of the, of the, of the grades, the, the, the credits and so on, that the students require to make it to get into, into the universities itself is also significantly higher. So, I guess the point of, of, of this, this thing is that every thing we could, every, every single initiative, every single policy, we can always do better. And that's something that I've acknowledged. But the point is this, we are not that far worse off. Today, if you look at the absolute numbers, three quarters of our population, of our PMEs, are in good jobs. One quarter of them are, in, are, are filled by foreign work pass holders. Our glass is not even half full. Our glass is three quarters full. And we're looking at it from that perspective. Are you saying that we should even adjust that? Of course, we should try to bring it up to, to the fact that it would be 90% or 100% full. But let's also be mindful of the sentiment, the worries, and also the hard work of the other three quarters in that glass that's three quarter full. I think thank you very much. I, I look forward to, to, uh, to a robust debate with Mr. Leong, with Ms. Pua. Um, I think when they can put up the, the, the questions uh, where I don't struggle so hard to, to follow, I think that would be very welcoming. Um, th thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I think, Mr. Speaker, you agree with me. We really need to move on. And to move on, can I go back to my two questions for the two honourable members from the PSP? One, that do they not agree FTA, including SICA, are fundamental to Singapore's economic survival? Yes or no? Two, SICA does not allow a free flow of Indian PMEs into Singapore. And this is a falsehood and a gross misunderstanding of the agreement. If they agree, I think we can have a meaningful debate when they table the motion. Mr. Leong. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Thank you, uh, Minister, uh, for the two questions. Um, as I said, the uh, answers to the two questions actually requires a bit more uh, debate and, uh, and study. 
But first, I want to say that PSP and Hazel and I, we are for FTAs. And having heard that the jobs and livelihood of people are not being used as a bargaining chip, we are very reassured that uh, our interest, the Singaporean interests, are being taken care of. However, whether SICA has contributed to the overall influx of nationals from the country, I think we need to study a bit more. Because we have to go back and look at the numbers provided by the two ministers uh, to, to, to see what is the share of the uh, Indian uh, PMETs in our overall PMET workforce, and uh, to take into consideration what Minister Tan Siling has said about, the, about we really need them, then we would like to know whether they are skills transfer programs, uh, whether really our education system is really catching up fast enough before we can make and also the uh, uh, various practices in the market before we can make a final conclusion that SICA is really neutral to beneficial for Singapore. Thank you. Minister Ong. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Leong. So, I will just summarize that, yes, the PSP now agrees that FTAs are fundamental to Singapore's economic survival, and that includes SICA. So at least that is a common ground that we have established. I think that's useful, and thank you, Mr. Leong, for that. And second, the PSP now agrees net movement of natural person, Chapter 9, is not used as a chip, and we're not giving away our rights for immigration, and there is no free flow of Indian professionals into Singapore. I read, I, I hear, I, if I hear him right, I think he's confirming that. He is not sure about the overall balance of the free trade agreement. I think we'll leave it there for our debate later on. But I think this too, I would say, form quite good common ground. But it also means, it will also mean... Mr. Leong, I will call you when, your time is, when it's time to call you. Let and it will also finish. mean, naturally that must mean the PSB, PSP will take back their allegations that Seeker has led to an unfettered flow of Indian professionals into Singapore. Thank you. Mr. Leong. Um, speaker, um, to what the minister has said just now, I think there's a bit of a, a, a misinterpretation. What I've said is that we, are in, we fully support FTAs. We know that that's important for Singapore. And we appreciate the point that we, uh, we are not using the movement of people as a bargaining chip in the negotiation of the FTAs. But as to whether SICA has contributed to the influx of some of the PMETs in the Singapore in relation to our overall foreign talent policy, we have to explore that. And we, we don't agree that uh, uh, SICA is net beneficial to Singapore at this stage. Minister Ong. I think Mr. Leong is waffling. Yes, no, yes, no, it's quite hard to catch. I take it that you are not withdrawing your allegation, and so be it. And I think that will be, well, at least we got you to say FTA and SICA is fundamental to our survival. But if you continue to allege, notwithstanding all our explanation, I think there is no choice. We have to leave it as such. Uh, it is regrettable because uh, generations of FTA negotiators worked very hard to make sure our interests are all protected. And this is not a backdoor. This is not an avenue for any professionals from any country to enter Singapore in a, with a free hand and unfettered. But I, I, I take it that this is PSP's uh, position, notwithstanding hearing all our explanations. It is most regrettable, but we will have to accept what, how they feel. Ms. Janet Ang.
Mr. Speaker, I guess on this topic, I you declare that... You may remove the mask, if you wish. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Please forget it. Sorry. Yeah, I would like to declare that I'm a council member of the Singapore Business Federation. I thank, you know, on behalf of uh, the business community, both the minister's ministerial com statement and, um, yeah, of course, you know, contrary to... <laughs> You know, closing the doors, the businesses are begging, please open the doors, we need workers, otherwise who's going to do the work? But nonetheless, if I may, you know, I am a product of Singapore's MNC strategy and during the budget debate and COS, I have shared my views regards embracing diversity of talents from all over the world so that we can be uniquely competitive. So, you know, for today, I will not go there. I will talk a little more about... Um, FTAs, in support of FTAs, and um, a lot have been said, but perhaps, yeah, if you all uh, can bear with me a while, uh, you know, from the business community, why is this important? Now, as a small and open economy without natural resources, we are, of course, highly dependent on international trade and highly integrated, well-functioning global value chains. And international trade not only provides us with the products that we import and consume, but also connects us to the global market that supports our businesses and sustains our economy, creating the good jobs that Singaporeans have enjoyed in the past and aspire to in, for the future. So with Singapore's international trade more than three times its gross GDP, our livelihoods and prosperity depend heavily on international trade. And for Singapore businesses, free and open trade premised on the foundation of a rules-based multilateral trading system is crucial to ensuring a conducive, stable and predictable environment. This is particularly important for us considering that we are just a little red dot. Hence the importance for, of free trade agreements. So as Minister Ong has earlier said, we have over 26 FTAs and our network of free trade agreements covers about 85% of global GDP enhancing the value proposition of countries and economies that sit at the nodes of these networks, and Singapore is one of them. So the FTAs yield tangible value to our companies. In 2018 alone, I understand that our companies enjoyed more than 1.1 billion in tariff savings. These FTAs accord our businesses preferential market access, into the markets of our major trading partners, lowering entry barriers for the export of goods and services, as well as protecting their investments in other countries. So the strong FTA network can be a tool for our businesses, not only in reducing their costs and time to market, but also in ensuring a predictable trading environment. Despite the pandemic, Singapore's total services trade exports in 2020 amounted to $259 billion with China, US, EU and Malaysia as our top trading partners. I would dare say that because our Singapore businesses remain very plucked into our FTA network, we have been able to ride the storm of COVID-19 a little better than if we were disconnected. Now, we should know firsthand what it's like to be disconnected, considering the impact we experience in aviation and tourism because of border closures. Trade, along with foreign direct investments into Singapore, will drive our economic recovery and the resumption of business activities post-COVID-19, even as we restlessly reinvent our industries, innovate ideas, products, services, and business models to emerge stronger post-pandemic. Now, through this crisis, the businesses have realized the urgent need to build resilience in their business models and supply chains, partly by exploring new markets and supply sources and many have shifted away from lean supply chain models to adopt agile supply chain strategies. And the FTAs are even more relevant uh, than ever before for our businesses. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically accelerated digital transformation to the top of the board's agenda in every company. And Singapore's Digital Econo Economy Agreements, DEAs, with Chile, New Zealand, Australia, and potentially the UK, look to provide frameworks for regulatory cooperation in support of trade and business in the digital economy and address issues arising um, from these emerging technologies. And as we have heard from uh, Minister of 
trade and industry yesterday. Uh, you know, MTI and government agencies have been hard at work looking into various new opportunities for us to enter into new trade agreements, including for renewable energy, green economy, etc. And uh, you know, so on, on that count, you know, frank, frankly speaking, on behalf of the business community, you know, I'd like to acknowledge all the efforts uh, by MTI, uh, you know, MOF, and all the government agencies for their efforts in helping our businesses to be competitive. Now, it's all about teamwork. So in order to help our companies familiarise themselves with Singapore FTAs and improve their global competitiveness, you know, the business community supported by Singapore Business Federation holds regular workshops as well as seminars and provides complimentary advisory services to assist the Singapore companies on FTA-related inquiries. And businesses can utilise these available resources and leverage SBF to provide feedback on how existing and future FTAs can better serve their needs, and we continually do so. So to conclude, Singapore businesses, in our opinion, cannot afford to take a wait-and-see approach. We will need to navigate the pressing issues that adversely impact supply chains and business processes. Singapore businesses need to be born international. Across industries, developing the DNA to tap into overseas markets and to trade with multilateral partners is critical for businesses to be successful given Singapore's limited domestic market. So FTAs offer a key tool for businesses to expand into new markets enhancing accessibility of different markets by allowing businesses to export more freely and easing some of the regulations. Now, but Singapore and Singaporeans must humbly recognise that we are vulnerable. Past success does not guarantee future success. We need to exercise humility and restlessly reinvent ourselves. Some areas of concern highlighted in the recent World Competitiveness Report, in my opinion, is rather worrisome. These include potential relocation of businesses being a threat to the Singapore economy, perception of Singapore's changing attitude towards globalisation, which Minister Ong has also highlighted earlier, the availability of skilled labour, qualified engineers and competent senior managers in Singapore, regardless of you know, um, nationality. So the availability of skilled labour and competent senior managers is a, is a concern, and as well as our immigration laws preventing hiring of foreign labour. Now, such perceptions could erode Singapore's attractiveness as a business capital. And our businesses are concerned, and I'm sure the government is equally concerned. And I believe Singaporeans, we should be concerned as well. Singapore's miracle has been attributed to our leaders deciding on a few right strategies, generation upon generation, and then together with the support and passion of all Singapore businesses and workforce, executing those strategies brilliantly with humility, but with pride and solidarity as Singaporeans. We believed in each other. We have done it before. We can do it again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nibiam Heng. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, thank you. <clears throat> well, I wasn't intending to speak, but I just want to, since Minister Ong Yee Kang, uh, mentioned that I was the chief negotiator for SICA, I thought I, I must put on record the question that Mr. Leong Man Wai asked. Let me first say that I'm terribly troubled by the way that the PSP has taken this, and I want to put on record clearly that the movement on natural persons is a very important chapter, but it was not used as a bargaining chip to trade for what else we got. It was not. So let me give you a very brief history of FTAs, because I was in the Ministry of Trade Industry at that time, as, first as a Deputy Secretary as, and then as a Permanent Secretary. In 2000, the Doha round of WTO negotiation was launched, and Minister George Yeo then and I were at Doha. We saw the entry of China into the WTO. But soon after the launch, 
our assessment and Minister George Hill's assessment then was that it looks like Doha round will not go very far. And indeed, he was proven correct. And he said, what does Singapore need to do to ensure our continued survival? So Minister Ong Kang earlier mentioned about the importance of free trade to Singapore. Trade is more than three times our GDP and will continue to be so. So he decided that we should pursue free trade agreement. And our very first free trade agreement was with New Zealand, two small little economies. And I must say that I can tell you that people are laughing that what could two small trade little economies do uh, to advance the cause of free trade? But well, we persisted and we got the first agreement done. And thereafter, we went on to do a number of other agreements. And when I was permanent secretary, I was in the trenches negotiating many agreements with our ASEAN counterparts. And that's how we had the ASEAN Economic Com uh, Free Trade Agreement that was in enhanced, the ASEAN Economic Community. And thereafter, it was not just ASEAN. There were two things that we did. One was free trade agreement between Singapore and other countries, far bigger economies, Japan, Australia, US, and then more recently, you know, the European Union. Now, you ask quite correctly, what is Singapore's bargaining chip? The honest answer is very little. We only have tariffs on three items, beer, stout, samsu. Yeah. And what is that as a bargaining chip? But I think a very important quality for the, our public policy is that we must be creative and we must learn to meet the needs of other countries, to see what may be in the agreement that is ben of benefit to them. So how do we manage to negotiate trade agreements with big economies that are ex have a lot of concerns? For example, Japan was very concerned about agriculture. And uh, in the case of India, there was an even wider range of concern. So let me tell Mr. Leong and your team that I spent three years of my life negotiating this agreement because although I was a permanent secretary, and permanent secretary usually just supervise, they don't get into the trenches. The Indian side decided that it was an important agreement. They would have a perm sack. And Minister George will say, well, you have no choice. So I ended up being the uh, chief negotiator for SICA. And I can tell you the amount of homework I had to do to look at how it, we can come to an agreement. I went to different parts of India because there was objection from every part of India from business group to states. And I, I can share with you long stories about some of those most, well, most intriguing demands, which I managed to explain why we can't do that. So the movement of natural person was a chapter which, indeed, the Indian negotiators were very keen because they said, what do we get? Well, I said, no, because this is of great importance to Singapore. You have a population that's over a billion. Singapore has a population of, at that time, probably about three odd million. And I say it will be easily swamped. So we must have very strict agreements on this. And that was, in fact, one of the, among the last chapter, there were two chapters that were the most difficult to conclude for which I never let go and we got what we needed. So, I think Mr. Leong must not think that you said, I hope that you know, the government has the people's interest at heart. Of course, why do we negotiate free trade agreements and why do we do this public service if it's not with our, the interest of our people at heart? And why do I spend three years of my life doing the agreement? So please be reasonable and don't mislead Singaporeans. Now, I want to raise two other issues which are very important. Two, first, you said that why is it that we don't have talent? And what happened to our university? Senior Minister Teo Chi Hien was Education Minister, so was I, and all our Education Ministers are sitting here. I must say that I'm extremely proud of what our schools and our IHLs have done 
over the years to groom Singaporeans. The World Bank has ranked Singapore the best in the world in educating our people. So please do not go around thinking that, you know, we have not put in enough effort. And in fact, we have increased cohort participation rates from 20% of cohort to now 40%. Government funded. We now have six universities. We have polytechnics and ITEs, which provide the most valuable uh, practice-oriented learning. We have done, enhanced it with Skills Future. We have now worked and uh, work and learn, earn and learn program and a whole range of programs. So I think, Mr. Leong, you will better serve Singaporeans if you help Singaporeans understand how changes are taking place so quickly and you must help to encourage people to upgrade and learn and learn new skills and work to support our unions in forming company training committees and job security council and the like in order to raise the ability of Singaporeans to compete. So I think to say that our education system has not done a good job or the government has not put enough, I would seriously ask you to rethink that and come back and debate us on that. Let me also end by mentioning two very important points which our two MPs have just raised, Professor Hun Hien Tik, who made an excellent point that the future of competition will be a future of competition of innovation and technology. And it is very important for us to bring in some of the best people to work with Singaporeans, grow Singaporeans to be able to excel in that new realm. It's going to be a different world. So please do not get stuck in the old world and think that you know, we can excel all on our own. Let us have an open attitude to work with countries around the world who are willing to cooperate and work with us. I just last week had a very good session with the Minister of Higher Education, Research and Innovation of France. And we talk about what France and Singapore can do together in our research agenda, in our innovation agenda. And France is not a small country. And they had a long history of science and innovation. So that's a very important point that Professor Hun Hien Tech had made. And the other important point, uh, Ms. Janet Ang, who talked about the digital opportunities and the new market. No sector in our economy is going to be immune from competition. Economists used to have this concept of tradable and non-tradable sector. Non-tradable sectors are naturally protected because they are in your neighborhood. Your neighborhood shops, who is going to compete with you? Today, with e-commerce, our neighborhood shops are under stress. And that is why we have a program as part of our industry transformation to help our neighborhood shops upgrade. That is why IMDA has put in so much effort on this SME Go Digital and, and so on. So I think it is very important for the right policy in Singapore, A, to stay open, B, to learn how to cope with changes, which will be accelerating, and C, make the best use of science, technology, and innovation to allow us to move forward and fourthly, maintain unity so that businesses, unions, workers, and the government work closely together to make the very significant changes that you need to make. Thank you. Mr. Pridam Singh. Mr. Pridam Singh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just have two... Um, supplementary questions, one for Minister Ong and one for uh, Minister Dr Tan. Uh, for Minister Ong, um, in 2016, um, my parliamentary colleague, uh, Workers' Party MP Leon Pereira, asked the then Minister of Manpower, uh, and this was arising out of feedback from the ground about, about Sika uh, issues of uh, a lot of uh, Indian nationals uh, working on the ground. And the question Mr Leon Pereira asked was, about the number of ICTs that were working in Singapore through SICA. Uh, and at that point, the reply that came was, um, the ministry does not disclose data on foreign manpower with breakdown by nationality, including data on ICTs. Uh, 
in February this year, Mr. Leong Man Wai of the PSP asked a question about the IC number of ICTs working in Singapore. Um, this time, the government disclosed overall ICT numbers uh, over employment pass holders, um, and the number was, I think, something like 5%, 5% of EP holders. Um, today, we have more information uh, that about that last year at least 500, uh, for last year at least 500 of these uh, uh, ICTs originated from uh, from India. Um, the point I want to make to the minister and to the government at large is there is opportunity to quell or at least to nip some of these issues in the bud when they start moving into the realm of xenophobia, uh, nativism, uh, and one important outlet for that is information. And in August 2020, uh, a Straits Times reporter mentioned um, that, and I quote, ICTs were a key bone of contention with respect to Sika. And if this information had been made known earlier, it does occur to me whether a lot of the misunderstanding, the reaction we see on Sika could have been addressed and actually uh, nipped in the bud. And so I, I hope the government understands that with more information, actually, we can hold the line better in terms of some of these discussions moving into a realm of uh, xenophobia and so forth. My question to um, uh, Dr. Tan si, uh, Minister Tan si Ling uh, pertains to uh, TAFEP and the strengthening of uh, the enforcement arm of TAFEP. Uh, we, had this, uh, we had an exchange in the opening of Parliament about this. And I'd just like to uh, confirm with uh, Dr. Tan uh, whether raising the number, the enforcement arm of TAFEP is uh, on the cards and what extent has, what discussions have taken place since August last year in so far as how TAFEP will be beefed up. Uh, the WP has a position about um, anti-discrimination legislation. Is that something that uh, uh, MOM uh, will, will be prepared to look into? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Pritam, for his uh, question. We are reviewing our existing frameworks. And um, the suggestion that you've talked about, um, the position um, that you have alluded to in terms of uh, legislation and all that, it's not something that has just come out from the Workers' Party. If you go back in terms of the, um, the past, uh, um, proceedings and so on. I believe that um, uh, quite a number of the Labour MPs, um, including uh, Mr. Patrick Tay, um, I believe that um, a non-Labour MP, I think even Mr. Lewis had also raised it um, at the same time uh, or, or, or over different times. One of the things that um, the assurance I want to give to the House um, to everyone who has raised it and who is concerned about this is to allow myself, together with the team, together with the tripartite partners, to go deep, look at all the different implications, look at also the various options that we have to see how we can strengthen it. And as I've alluded to in my speech, um, Mr. Singh, I think you appreciate the fact that given where we are today, it's a very tight rope that we're navigating. On the one hand, we want to continue to strengthen, to tighten. On the other hand, businesses um, you know, have this competing interest of asking us to, 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 to be a, li a bit more lax. One of the reassurance that I want to, and our ministry wants to reassure members of the House here, is our consistent focus on, and we have never divided our attention away or, or diverted our attention from developing the Singaporean core. We are fully cognizant of the angst, the fears, the worries about making sure that there's fair, there's equal opportunity in terms of even the development 
to capability transfers, capability development, fair hiring, promotion, and so on and so forth. All those things we will be reviewing in order for us to strengthen that framework. So I don't want to, to sort of um, go down a prescribed route today because we are exploring the entire uh, universe. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Minister Ong Kang, if we can wrap up the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will answer Mr. the Leader of the Opposition's question and then seek to conclude this debate. Um, I, I take to heart what the Leader of Opposition said, that with information, we can quell such falsehoods much earlier. We work in the bureaucracy. Some data is classified secret, confidential, so on. So we are not at liberty to always disclose them. But what you say is true. Some information is better to come out early. Uh, and then we can move on. And especially, as you say, when it concerns issues like racism or xenophobia, it's much better to quell it early. And I take comfort that based on what you say, I think you do agree that FTA seeker is fundamental to our survival. And that really, I hope you heard our explanation and is convinced that Seeker Chapter 9 does not allow an affected inflow of Indian professionals. If you disagree and I misrepresented you, please jump up and correct me. <laughs> I don't think you were. Yeah. Um, DPM Heng, myself, we are former trade negotiators fighting in the trenches with our fellow teammates, which is why I think we both felt compelled to say something today. Um, negotiating an FDA requires a lot of dedication and hard work. It takes a toll on the family because you are out of country all the time. Our negotiators, we are up against very formidable uh, partners sometimes. Our job is to advance Singapore's interests while protecting our areas of sensitivities. But we work hard at it, nevertheless, because we know it makes a huge difference to Singapore. Benefit industries and companies create jobs for our people, secure our place in the world. This is where we are coming from. So I felt sad somewhat that the PSP did not withdraw their allegations. Yeah. This, how, when we explain how an FTA works and how Chapter 9 works, it is a statement of fact. This is how it works. It's not a matter of your opinion or your perspective. So the logical thing for PSP to do, I felt, is to withdraw the allegations. Then we can discuss employment policies, how we can better protect, educate, train our workers, and these are very legitimate questions. But PSP did not do the logical thing. I couldn't hear a definitive position from Mr. Leong or Ms. Hazel Poa waffle a bit, and then I think what I heard was they cannot conclude either way now whether seeker is better or worse for our workers. But if you cannot conclude either way, then the honourable thing is to also withdraw the allegations while you figure out which way you want to lean. But I don't think we saw what was logical nor honourable. A successful FTA strategy is not just about negotiating skills. It's important, but fundamentally it requires us to be broad-minded and able to cast our sights far and wide to the whole world and work with like-minded partners out there. And that is why COVID-19 is such an existential crisis for us. It has forced us to close our borders. But I'm confident that once we get the great majority of population vaccinated, control the pandemic, we can reopen the borders progressively again. But what I'm worried about that even when our borders are reopened, what about our hearts and our minds? Will they be reopened? If because of COVID or during the, during the COVID pandemic, anti-foreigner sentiments, xenophobia, creeps into our collective psyche, and even if our borders are open, hearts and minds are not and will remain closed, then we will not recover from COVID-19. Then we will truly have a long COVID. 
Of all times, this is the worst time in the middle of a crippling pandemic to talk about turning inwards to reject FTAs, reject globalization. I say we should emerge from COVID-19 announcing to the world that Singapore continue to be that shining jewel in Southeast Asia, the largest transshipment port in the world, the special Changi experience, a financial services hub and IT capital, a hub for manufacturing, hospitality, mines, so on. Here the world converges. You can experience the richness of many cultures and also the uniquely Singapore character. Singaporeans will benefit immensely from this. And most importantly, we will be more united and we must be more united than ever. And every one of us know that because we all did our part, whether it's getting vaccinated, undergoing regular testing, observe safe management measures, helping others in need, taking care of patients, all of us did our part. We stayed united. And the unity is what helped us conquer and overcome this pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Person to sending order number 44 to the motion to consider two ministerial statements on free trade agreements and foreign manpower lapses at the conclusion of debate.